for anybody for anybody who uh, uh, would like, you can uh, leave the the recorded session now uh, if you uh, 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 don't want to be recorded. Um, when it comes to the uh, continuous learning point certificates, uh, after the session is ended, uh, we uh, capture your attendance and we'll be uh, uh, doing a quick quality assurance check in our uh, systems to ensure that attendance is uh, correctly loaded. And then we'll be uh, uh, generating emails with your certificates attached. Uh, that can that process can take up to two weeks. Uh, so just bear with uh, the system as it goes through uh, and uh, does a quality check and then sends your CLP certificates to you at a future date, hopefully within about two weeks. If you don't receive your uh, CLP certificate within that uh, window, you're welcome to reach out to me again at david.dehan at gsa.gov and I'll uh, ensure that you receive a, a copy of your certificate. Um, today's session, we've asked everybody to be muted when uh, you entered the, uh, the meeting room. And that's just simply to give courtesy uh, to not only the speakers, uh, but also to everybody else who's listening in. If you would uh, like to ask a question, you have a couple of uh, various ways that you can do that. Uh, I believe we have a Q&A pod that you can access. You can also chat your question, or if appropriate, uh, you can go ahead and unmute um, yourself. I just ask that you identify yourself uh, and, and Again, give respect to everybody else. When you've completed speaking, uh, please remute uh, yourself. Um, so with that, um, hopefully you are seeing the poll and answering the poll. Uh, I'm gonna just give a, a quick introduction to uh, our speakers this morning uh, and read a little bit about them. Um, Melissa Minor. Uh, she'll be giving a presentation about the green procurement uh, compilation. Uh, Melissa supports sustainability and cli climate adaptation initiatives as a procurement analyst for GSA's Office of Policy and Compliance. She holds a bachelor's degree in business management and is working experience in federal acquisitions as a contracting officer for over 10 years. Uh, Michael on the equipment inside the building. And that's why I want you guys to check the screen. And that's the reason that I ask that people mute themselves. Uh, so uh, Michael Bloom, uh, Michael is a high performance buildings program advisor with the US General Services Administration Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings. With 21 years of experience at GSA, Michael is the National Program Manager for the Sustainable Facilities Tool. And Katie Miller is a Senior Leader for Climate with the Federal Acquisition Service. During the course of her career, she has led a variety of federal climate and sustainability programs, overseeing initiatives at the White House Council on Environmental Quality and founded a climate change consulting firm. And finally, uh, Mr. Brian Booth is the team lead and acting branch chief for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories Customer Engagement Branch. He and his team support partner agencies by completing scope reviews, answering technical questions, and providing training on government-wide contracts offered by their office. Brian is finally referred to as the Earth Muffin by me and his colleagues. He has been involved with environmental and sustainable topics and issues for over 20 years with GSA. So that's a little bit about our speakers this morning. Let me, uh, uh, and thank you Guadalupe, uh, yes, if you want to chat where you're located at, uh, we'd love to 
we'd love to know where you're at. Uh, so thank you. Um, let me go ahead and get back to the poll. Let's see, polls. All right. So I'm going to ask you to, again, answer the questions in the poll. If you haven't done so already, give you about another minute here, and then we'll end the poll and share the results. In the meantime, uh, my colleague, customer service directors uh, from GSA Region 7, uh, Southwest Region, uh, are on the, on the line as well. Uh, they'll be helping to uh, keep us all on track and answering questions as best they can and helping you if you need uh, any assistance. So uh, please feel free to uh, uh, communicate not only any uh, problems you may be having uh, this morning with the session, uh, the uh, virtual tool uh, or Zoom, if you will, and uh, uh, feel free to ask questions. We're uh, super excited about this topic and we're interested to hear from you. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results uh, with you. Hopefully you can see them. Looks like uh, uh, question number one, how confident are you in incorporating sustainability into acquisitions? You know, roughly 10% are very confident. 51% uh, are somewhat confident, uh, not very confident, 29%, and not confident at all, 11%. Uh, going on to question number two, what is your experience using sftool.gov? And 2% uh, use sftool for every procurement. 9% have used it a few times. 4% uh, have used it once. And 86% have never used sftool. And finally, question number three, which of the following are benefits of buying sustainable products and services? Uh, again, uh, life cycle cost savings, 15%, resource and operational efficiency, 12%, reduced air and water pollution, 7%, and all of the above, 82%. So, well, thank you for uh, sharing, and I'll go ahead and uh, <clears throat> get ready to turn it over to Melissa Miner, who's going to start us off. Uh, with an overview and an introduction to the green procurement compilation. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we're going to walk through sourcing sustainable products and services with the green procurement compilation, which is part of the sustainable facilities tool or sftool.gov. So as David said, I'm Melissa Miner. I'm a procurement analyst with GSA's Federal Acquisition Services Office of Policy and Compliance. So the objective of today's training is to learn how to navigate the green procurement compilation, explore where to buy green products, then we'll go through some of the tools and resources available to help support your next sustainable acquisition. So first thing I want to clarify, so we're on the same page in terms of what is meant by sustainable acquisition, we are talking about buying products with certain specified environmental attributes. We do not have one statute covering all our environmental programs. Instead, we have several statutes, executive orders, and other regulations that establish sustainable acquisition requirements. This is just a list of a few of them. So FAR Part 23 implements statutory sustainable acquisition requirements. One thing I want to make clear is sustainable acquisition requirements apply across the board, regardless of the size of the acquisition. 
There are lots of other provisions in the FAR for sustainable acquisitions, starting with part 4.303, which says when printing, the contractor is required to print double-sided and on at least 30% post-consumer fiber paper. In FAR part 5.207, it states your synopsis must include sustainable acquisition requirements. And in part 11, describing requirements, it talks about material composition, such as rec using recovered materials, bio-based, energy efficient. And in part 12 and 13, you'll see the prescription for clause 52.212-5 or 52.213-4, which implements statutes or executive orders, including many of the clauses prescribed in part 23. So sustainable acquisition doesn't only apply to products, but it applies to services as well. FAR Part 23103B defines when sustainable acquisitions applies to services. For instance, products delivered or used in performance of a service must meet federal sustainable purchasing requirements. The Biden-Harris administration has established the revitalization of the federal government's sustainability efforts and addressing the climate crisis as top priorities, setting ambitious targets for decarbonizing the federal portfolio, and has issued several executive orders that call for leveraging the purchasing power of the federal government to drive innovation and prioritize actions on climate change in the policymaking and procurement processes. So GSA makes it easy for you to determine which products have environmental attributes and the sustainable acquisition requirements that apply to federal buyers. The Green Procurement Compilation, also known as the GPC, consolidates federal green purchasing information into one location. So it's a single point of entry for identifying sustainable acquisition requirements. So the sftool.gov main page displays instructions on how to use the site depending on which role you serve. Um, I know 86% of you said you've not used this site, uh, those that uh, took the poll. So please feel free to, if you have multiple monitors, um, you know, jump into sftool.gov and follow along. So you're familiar with uh, the website and can kind of see for yourself uh, what I'm showing you on these uh, slides. So if you start here at the sftool.gov main page, you'll see uh, options for the best fit um, in your area of expertise. So there's options for procurement professional, facility manager, leasing specialist, or project manager. And those are just instructions with visual aids on how to nav navigate the site based on your area of interest. Um, so if you need a refresher, come back here. This is a great way to kind of get a review on how to use the site. Uh, to access the green procurement compilation, you'll select the procure menu from the top bar. And again, this is explained if you also went through the procurement professional option um, to select a role and how to get started. Again, that's sftool.gov. So as you get into the procure menu, you will see the green procurement compilation. There is a helpful video introduction and options to learn more about the site right in the main menu. And to find sustainable acquisition requirements that apply to federal procurement, you have a few options. You can enter a product or service category in the search bar along the top of the menu. You can explore products according to their workspace, which is on the lower right-hand side of the top menu. That is in green. Or as you scroll down, you have categories of products and services to choose from. Currently, there are 27 categories of products and nine categories of services.
So if we were to select landscaping services, the services section provides an overview of this uh, landscaping services category. It includes sample clauses and provisions, as well as text from past solicitations. If you continue down to the required green products section, under landscaping services, it includes BioPreferred, CPG, and WaterSense. You can see which products pair with these services and meet these requirements by selecting the View Related GPC Products link. There is an optional green practices section. This lists some great ideas for how to incorporate optional language into your statement of work or requirements definitions, such as incorporating pollinator friendly honeybee practices, creating wildlife habitats to compensate for land loss due to urban sprawl, prescribing to burns to maintain natural landscaping and things of that nature. The section really just provides lists of best practices that capture how to make services more sustainable. There's an evaluation factor section. So if you're acquiring landscaping services, you'd look at if they're using integrated pest management, less water, are they using chemicals? And can we build these into the evaluation factors? So you do not need to be an expert at knowing the various programs out there. You just need to get onto the site and let it guide you through what you need to know to make the best environmental decision when you're planning your acquisition all the way through to the evaluation factors. These evaluation factors are already written. You can copy and paste and just tailor them to fit your needs. And there's another opportunity of where to buy on this menu as well as references section with links to helpful resources. So that's an overview of the services category specific pages on the green procurement compilation. Now we'll take a look at products. If we look at cleaning products, there's a lengthy list of cleaning products that fall under this category. There are actually over 500 pages of uh, product and service categories on the green procurement compilation. So um, that's why there's search options, there's workspaces, and then there's these uh, categories of menus to help you find the right product that you're looking for. So for multi-purpose cleaners, for example, the top of the page in green is a search option to locate and learn about compliant products. The procurement information section shows which environmental programs are required by statute, which environmental programs federal agencies are required to purchase to the maximum extent practicable, and other federal programs that are recommended and optional. There is a section to the right showing where to buy compliant products as well. So the legal requirements fall under FAR subpart 23.7, 23.4, and 23.1, which is listed under the image. There's also links to those FAR parts. If you continue down the left-hand menu, there's an additional guidance section that outlines best practices as defined by the environmental programs supporting the products in this category. And the related workspaces takes you through the associated product categories related to cleaning products. It's the same workspace search option that's at the top of the green procurement compilation main page. So if we were to select the, I'll just go back here, this cafeteria option below the related workspaces. For example, it'll show you the workspace um, featured 
that you selected. Um, it shows all the systems supported in that workspace with links to the green procurement compilation products and services pages supporting each category of products within that system. So if you roll over the green circles in the image, it also will link you to applicable categories in that area of the individual workspace. It can be very helpful if you're more of a visual person. Um, it can also help you plan for your whole project and help kind of um, help you identify sustainable opportunities. There's several workspaces. Uh, this uh, last slide just kind of shows the related workspaces for multi-purpose cleaners, but there are um, many more workspaces than those. So the where to buy feature on the green procurement compilation product and service pages can lead you to numerous websites where you can find compliant products. I wanted to highlight a couple of the websites that the green procurement compilation might suggest as a source for buying sustainable products. The first one is called the GSA Advantage Environmental Isle, which allows you to search and purchase thousands of individual green products available through GSA's multiple award schedules. It has uh, easy to use filters for finding products that are compliant with sustainability requirements, such as buying products with recycled content, which is EPA's comprehensive procurement guidelines or CPG program. Uh, products which are energy efficient, which is the Energy Star program. We also have bio preferred products, which reduce our nation's reliance on petroleum and contributes to reducing adverse environmental and health impacts. There are environmentally preferable products such as EPEAT, which are registered electronic products. We have water efficient products, which is the Water Sense program. We offer cleaner chemicals, which is uh, what Safer Choice is. And we also have recommended EPA specification standards and eco labels. It is important to note that some environmental claims are self claims made by our GSA contractors and some are verified, such as Energy Star, WaterSense, and EPEAT. Also keep in mind that many schedules contain sustainable products and services mixed in with non-sustainable. So those filters and leaning on the GSA, uh, GSA Advantage environmental aisle are important steps in locating the best products for your acquisition. So global supply is another option to use when locating compliant products. And it's another option that the GPC um, will refer you to as you're looking to connect the requirements to making purchases. So GSA Global Supply is a one-stop source for your military and agency support needs from new tools to office supplies. Uh, when you order through Glo Global Supply, you are assured of regulatory compliance. You can filter by environmentally compliant solutions. And GSA Global Supply provides full accountability from order placement through delivery and billing. So the SF tool product search uh, is the easy button. If you go back to the procure main page, which is the, the green procurement compilation main page, it is the blue box. Um, it's where you'll find the specific products that comply with the sustainability requirements. This is uh, not a portal to purchase products, but a market research tool to find details about the brand name products available on the commercial market to help buyers simplify procurement, documentation, and reporting. Michael Bloom is going to go over this tool in more detail shortly. So back on that main green procurement compilation page, you'll also see a resources for vendors option at the top. And this takes you to a robust list of resources that include federal acquisition regulations and executive orders that apply to sustainable acquisition. 
of frequently asked questions for vendor section and training such as the greenhouse gas management training for federal contractors. Now, if you go back to that main page again and select the resource for buyers page, you'll find pre and post award strategies to ensure successful delivery of sustainable products and services. You can access training and review policy and guidance. You can also explore acquisition lifecycle tools, which brings up another important topic. One of the common myths is that when we buy sustainable products and services, it's going to cost us more. And it's just not true. A lot of these products cost the same, some cost less, some cost more, but it may end up being the best value for us when we look at the full life cycle. So from an acquisition perspective, each stage of the life cycle invol involves both a cost and environmental impact. So usually direct costs up to, and sometimes including delivery, make up the price of a product, but other costs such as required supplies, equipment maintenance, and disposal are often not included in the initial purchase price. The costs of environmental impacts such as the impact of pollution or toxic chemicals um, on human health and uh, worker productivity are also usually not included in a product's price. Sustainability is best viewed through the full life cycle of products and services. So we have to look at product life cycles, including extraction through end of life. There are life cycle tools on the GPC and um, remember the EPA's recommendations of specification standards and eco-labels help federal buyers identify and procure environmentally preferable products and services that give preference to multi-attribute life cycle based standards that address key impact areas. So basically those um, standards, specifications, and eco-labels give acquisition professionals a way to identify environmentally preferable products, which minimize all these costs and impact. Uh, they look beyond the price and performance to how a product is made, used, and disposed of. So another great resource under uh, the resources for buyers page is sample contract language, which helps contracting officers incorporate minimum sustainability requirements into uh, contracts for products. And then on the environmental program page, which is uh, available under the buyer resources, you'll find a description for many of the federal environmental programs with sample uh, contract language, quick access to the program's websites, and an option to filter the green procurement compilation for products under each program. So the buyer resources also include best practices for responsible business conduct, including promoting workers' rights and safe working conditions, preventing human trafficking, and addressing other human rights-related risks. The guidance shows steps that can be taken pre- and post-award. And then another great resource accessible from the buyer resources page is the information page on PFAS. This page was established to provide a plain language definition of PFAS chemicals and their impact, policy and guidance surrounding PFAS that allows buyers to prioritize substitutes for products containing PFAS, and it provides you with covered product categories, links you directly to EPA's website, and provides a summary of criterion language. This is a quick snapshot of a lot of the useful acquisition resources that I've shared with you today. And I recommend saving these links for future access once these slides are available.
So if you want to stay connected and get the latest news on the green procurement compilation, I encourage you to sign up to the GPC newsletter. Simply email the address on the slide using the subject line GPC subscribe. So some key takeaways, use the GPC to locate sustainability requirements applicable to federal acquisitions. Uh, you can find compliant products using GSA Advantage Environmental Isle or GSA Global Supply. The website is full of resources, so really lean on this site, whether you're in the acquisition planning phase, conducting market research, drafting a solicitation, or confirming compliant products were delivered in accordance with your contract requirements. And that concludes uh, my portion of this presentation. Is there any questions? This was great information. And again, for everybody who's attending, we, uh, we will allow you to unmute yourself uh, if you'd like to ask a question directly, or you can chat it uh, and we'll try and have Melissa answer. Um, Melissa, um, thinking about uh, the GPC, um, in terms of adding new products or adding new product categories, is there any work uh, that's being done to consider other uh, product categories that may not uh, be currently reflected in the GPC? So that's a great question. The the GPC product and service categories are all based off of the FAR requirements, the eco labels. Uh, so if Energy Star were to incorporate a new product under its program, it would be added to the GPC. So it's really driven from that side of um, environmental, the basically the environmental programs drives that. I mean, there are a lot of resource pages though for useful tips and optional uh, practices. And I do recommend if you have recommendations um, for additional statements of work or contract language you've seen used in, um, in your agency, or um, even if it's not federal, but state, local. I mean, we've incorporated contract language from a lot of different sources and you can email that same link that's um, signing up for that newsletter and just provide us with any recommendations and we'll consider you know where they'll fit into the site because we really want it to be robust. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I just wanted to let you know that you're getting a lot of uh, great reactions uh, you for your question. presentation as well as your topic. Uh, Brian Hogan, I just got to call you out and say, I'm psyched too. Uh, Brian says, I'm so psyched about this topic. So uh, thanks, Brian. And, uh, you know, thanks, Melissa, for uh, psyching us up. Hey, uh, Levette Santiago asks, can you discuss sustainable acquisition waivers? Under which conditions are they allowed? So um, there are exceptions to using environmentally preferable products. So if the product does not meet the performance needs, are not reasonably available, or, or are only available at an unreasonable price, and these are for commercially off-the-shelf available items, those are the exceptions. I'm not familiar with waiver process for those, but... Um, I mean, if there's another, are you referring to something outside of the exceptions? If I, if I could jump in one, uh, one area I remember that there's a waiver for is for um, Ener the Energy Star and FEMP designated product categories. Um, so uh, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, section 104, which makes me sound super wonky that I can quote a section of a law from 2005, 
Um, but it's really stuck with me. There is a requirement there to have a written exception from the head of your agency. Um, if you've determined that uh, for the, ex of the reasons that Melissa just outlined there, that uh, an energy star or FEMP designated product does not meet um, your procurement needs. Uh, so that is one area where you definitely do need to have a written uh, exception on file. That's great. And uh, feedback from Levet, excuse me, is that uh, uh, you covered uh, her question. Um, and, and uh, you know, so uh, folks might want to stick around towards the end of the uh, seminar today. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time where we can really have a bi directional conversation about the topics today. I think our speakers would be very interested in participating in that type of conversation uh, to uh, hear from you, uh, you know, uh, on what's, uh, what's interesting you, uh, as well as uh, to share any additional information or answers. And we have we another we did have one more question or and it says uh, from Renee are you going to add purchasing pesticides direct not the service I I'm not I'm not sure I didn't know that we weren't selling pesticides on on GSA advantage but does anybody know so um, Melissa do you want help on that one yeah, sure. Thanks, Michael. Okay. So the way that the green procurement compilation is set up is that where there are federal environmental program rules or those EPA specification standards and eco labels, then we have a category coverage for a particular type of item. But some items are not covered by those things. And one of the reasons why pesticides it kind of falls in between when it comes to a covered category for green stuff is because pesticides are designed to kill things. And <laughs> the uh, Design for Environment program, which um, also does uh, things like the cleaning products that we use during COVID extensively, are things that actually... Uh, actually kill germs, right? So there is a coverage of pesticides, some of them, under the Design for the Environment program, which is also called Safer Choice, but Safer Choice is only the name that they use when there's no killing involved. Um, it's kind of an interesting distinction. So you can find some uh, pesticides for sale on GSA Advantage and, and other places, but you don't see the coverage of pesticides by environmental programs generally because they are designed to uh, eradicate either germs or pests. Uh, so um, keep your eye on that because there's a lot of connection between um, pesticides and chemicals of concern. And there are many uh, sustainability eco labels that cover chemicals of concern uh, and uh, they usually uh, exclude <laughs> a lot of pesticides from being uh, purchased. Uh, so that's the hopefully not a confusing answer, but uh, a reason why pesticides are a complicated topic when it comes to sustainable procurement. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a great point, Michael. And also a great transition over to uh, uh, the next topic on uh, the sustainable facilities tool, which uh, you'll be discussing. So uh, we'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Great. And thank you, Melissa, for great coverage on the GPC and uh, green procurement. Uh, I will admit that I have a faster pace voice than uh, Melissa. So I hope I don't switch gears too, uh, too dramatically on all of you uh, as I speak. So I'm going to be talking about SF tool in general uh, first. So zoom out to see where GPC lives and what else is there that might be helpful to you. And then I'm going to zoom in and go into detail about how exactly SF tool product search helps you do a lot of the things that Melissa talked about GPC has the categories, and then SF Tool Product Search has the products that um, meet those categories. Essentially, to do our best to make following all of the guidance Melissa just shared easy for you. 
So here we go. Um, when you land on that SF tool landing page, sftool.gov, um, that's what you see on the left. And what I would love for us to leave to leave with today is a really, really increasing that comfort level of when does sustainability matter in federal procurement and how can I do it and integrate it in everything I do without it taking more time, effort, and without it being confusing. And so SF Tool writ large is actually where we have gathered tools and best practices for green building and sustainable procurement way back since 2011. So for anybody at GSA who's been here at least that long, um, parts of this tool have been available since then. And I spoke to David before this uh, session started this morning, and I said, without CASE and without people at the regional level connecting what we do at the national level to the people who actually do this work, do the procurements, build the buildings, manage the buildings on the ground, we would be without a voice. Um, and I think that sessions like this are hopefully ways in which we can make sure more of you know the tools that we've worked hard to produce to make your jobs easier. And any way you can help us share the word would be welcome. So um, a micro goal within these presentations is I would love for you to know that SF tool exists. You kind of do that already. I would love you to get used to searching SF tool anytime you have a sustainability question before you go to Google. Go to SF tool. Google sometimes sends you to SF tool, by the way. Um, and you can search for buildings or just general concepts uh, like decarbonization, I will cover that, um, on SF tool and get what you need. I'd love for you to feel comfortable sharing the tool with others, using it, and also engaging with us to help improve it. Melissa mentioned that too. When you have examples that you uh, have that um, the tool helps you with, we'd love to hear about it. But also if we have gaps in what we're sharing, we'd love to know how to better serve you because you are our customers. So SF tool is that big, broad, place. It's actually over 4,000 pages long, and I don't mean that to scare you. It has search and user guides and everything to make that easy. The GPC is where you find those requirements all in one place, regardless of which agency set them, whether they're in the FAR or from EPA, USDA, or Department of Energy, they're all here. And we even have all the citations to the FAR language packaged with it, and I'll show you how that works. So you don't need to memorize policy, you just need to look for the thing you want to buy or deploy, and then we help you with the rest and all of the other information comes along with it. Um, I will walk you through user guides. Um, I will also mention that there is an SF tool wide LinkedIn page that gives a weekly tutorial. So if you follow us on LinkedIn, and I'll I'll include a slide at the end of this presentation where you can do that. Um, you'll get uh, extra training weekly uh, just by reading that. And then we have helpful tools. Some of you may uh, work in the built environment, so you know about the guiding principles um, that help us understand how to save energy, water, uh, think in terms of integrative design. All of that's built into this tool, too. Um, things like uh, tools to help people identify cost-effective upgrades in buildings, that's here. Um, tools to help people um, identify the current performance of their workplace in terms of sustainability and, and, and also in terms of flexibility and even equity is built into this tool too. And all of these things that I'm mentioning are free, not only to feds, but the entire universe. Because we realize that when we build a tool that's supposed to make things simple, we should share it with everybody. Um, and so by sharing with everybody, it also means that when we have the ability to explain complex things, uh, whether they're in buildings or procurement, um, that we might be able to help some project managers or some uh, uh, case folks explain complex ideas and even policies to the people who are their customers and point them to a resource that can help demystify some of these things. So let's look at different parts of SF tool um, besides the GPC. Before I go, we'll, then we'll take a break in the middle of my presentation and I'll cover most of what uh, SF tool product search is um, afterwards. Okay, so as you slide down the welcome page of sftool.gov, you see those um, user guides at the top. 
that Melissa mentioned, and I will show you all of what's in Procurement Professional. And we also have a box for teaching SF tool where we package one pagers, um, uh, video, et cetera, about, and even a um, PowerPoint deck about um, here's what's in the tool. So if you get excited about what you've heard today, you can share it with your teams or others that way. We have a trending pages uh, uh, box that actually shows you which parts of SF tool are the most popular each week. And we have helpful tools, which are uh, sets of tools uh, that are divided by procurement and built environment that help you actually do your work in, um, in regular uh, day's work. So let me walk you through the uh, learn and plan sections. The learn section is a lot like a glossary and a very strong de um, uh, definition session section. So it covers climate, energy, water, and health, and then other topics, including federal requirements. So you'll find all the full text versions of all the um, policies and laws, um, executive orders that uh, Melissa mentioned earlier under federal requirements. And the, under this climate page that you see on the left, you see that we have several different sections that cover climate, some of which will actually overlap really well with the topics that Katie is going to present at the end of our um, couple hour sessions here, um, like climate risk management. When it comes to the plan section, this section is really set up for project managers. Um, it is biased towards the built environment, but it does have a lot of in information about general concepts that I think are increasingly helpful uh, in procurement as well. You'll notice it's it's relatively small, but if you have good eyes, the third thing in the planning and engagement process says life cycle perspective. I'm going to show you what that page looks like in a sec. Um, but life cycle perspective, thinking beyond just cheapest first cost to thinking about the purchase price, the operations and maintenance costs, and the disposal costs of everything you're doing. It's really important. And the concept is really great when you kind of understand what where meaningful differences can be made in your procurement. And some of you may know there's there are very um, ambitious um, environmental goals for this administration set out. And one of them is to be net zero per, uh, emissions from procurement or net zero procurement by 2050. And we cannot get there unless we start thinking about where can procurement actually help make uh, emissions uh, or help reduce emissions, um, whether that's in limiting how far something is shipped or how much plastic is used to cover the things that we buy, or cardboard for that matter, um, or how much we actually buy. All of those things actually matter, and that life cycle perspective part of the planning section will help you there. It also covers cool things like green teams. If you have, uh, even if you're not a building person, you might have had a green team in your building because people care about recycling or better air quality in buildings, and that will show you how to set those kinds of things up. Um, that second section, guidance by project type, helps run furniture projects or space reno um, reconfiguration or renovation projects, or even whole building system upgrades, like redoing your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, and that's where the tools for cost-effective upgrades and, and things like that live. And then that last section, risk reduction and building resilience, is where we talk about topics like net zero energy and climate change adaptation and emissions mitigation. Great pages that cover topics that we know are important and that many of us feel like we kind of know or that we ought to know, um, but don't know where to go to get um, plain English definitions. That risk reduction and building resilience section is great for that. And Katie was one of the authors of many of those uh, pages too, and, and she's excellent as you'll hear. Um, in the in our uh, uh, sections, whether you search climate literacy or you just know where that is in the uh, learn page, um, we have some really helpful uh, resources like a climate literacy uh, primer. This covers the climate terms and tools that are in use today and helps us understand the difference between uh, those terms, um, which are really important to know. So you can get the climate literacy terms and tools page on SF tool. Mentioned that you can also learn about life cycle perspective and life cycle thinking. 
that both Melissa and I have covered already. And you notice that we, we give examples of what it is. And we also dive deep into even providing life cycle um, assessment examples. Um, so you can always, in a, you can always uh, dive deep into a subject or just stay on the surface. It's our goal to have SF tool help both novices and experts actually increase their knowledge. The explore section looks a lot like those green dots in the um, what spaces can I will would our sustainable products end up in? And that's not an accident. The explore section was actually uh, created all the way back in 2011 because we wanted to essentially give people tours of sustainable buildings and show them where they could make sustainable choices. And so anywhere you could do that, we put a green dot. And then when you hovered over that green dot, you got lots of information about what was there, whether that was lighting or ceilings or windows or light shelves or flooring or furniture, for instance. Um, and now when you go to Explore, you can get this kind of detailed information about not only workspaces like the cafeteria you saw earlier, or private offices or open office like what's shown here, but also uh, whole building systems like lighting, HVAC, water, indoor environmental quality, which is what IEQ stands for. So what we um, are hoping by making a presentation about, hey, look what's an SF tool to a bunch of procurement folks, uh, is that you can become conversant in the, even the systems or where this might be installed in ways that make you more comfortable about well, this is the kind of procurement I'm helping expedite. Um, and now I understand how these pieces come together. Um, and it really does explain each one of these systems in ways that um, somebody with an eighth grade or higher education can understand. Um, and when we do go into talking about building systems, we don't only talk about, hey, this is what the system is. That's where we start. We say, this is how managing this resource can save resources. This is how you can how it impacts finances. This is how it impacts operations and maintenance. Um, and this is how it impacts people. So each of those four perspectives about projects that touch buildings really helps us make the argument for why it's important to actually fund projects like this. And some of you may be in position to do that. SF tool explore section, especially the building systems can be a Rosetta Stone for that. Um, so let's pretend we clicked on the green dot here for flooring. What would it show you? So first, it gives you a couple pointers about what kind of flooring, uh, what issues with flooring you should be aware of. Things like choosing flooring with high recycled content or low VOCs. Guess what? Those eco labels we were talking about, that's exactly what they help us do. Um, and then it gives you buttons for design guidance, comparing systems, and then access to those federal requirements that actually go with flooring. If you go to the design um, guidance, it actually defines all those different types of flooring in one place. That's ha actually hard to do. Anybody who does market research about options knows that because you're usually going to multiple vendors to find out information like this. So you wanted to get all that in one place so people knew, well, what is the difference between linoleum and cork? Um, but wait, there's more. We also wanted you to understand how those things perform differently on environmental attributes. So we built in a way for you to compare up to three different kinds of flooring materials at once. And then you get a list of side-by-side -side comparisons. This is just a micro screenshot below of broadloom carpet, vinyl flooring, and bamboo. Um, but we do it on 23 different attributes. Um, so you can see which products have better or worse performance on those different environmental attributes. And one of the attributes, just one, is cost. And here I'll reiterate the idea that life cycle cost matters because first cost is just the purchase of things. It might be cheap to buy vinyl, for instance, but it is relatively expensive, expensive to dispose of vinyl. So it's good to know where you have a, a difference. It can be um, relatively expensive to buy bamboo, um, but it's actually quite cheap to maintain and very easy to dispose of. Now we'll also include things in this in the description of bamboo. Bamboo is usually shipped from 
China. So that has costs too when it comes to life cycle. What SF Tool tries to do is make sure that whenever anybody's looking into, well, what is the best choice? We give you the information and we give you green, yellow, red kind of indicators of good, bad, and ugly, um, but we let you make the decision. Um, and then we hope that you will go and purchase that best performing product that matches what you're trying to achieve uh, with all of the right federal environmental programs and eco levels. So you, by the way, flooring is just an example here. There are 128 different types of product types. These are product types like flooring that you can compare in SF tool. And here's what the federal requirements page looks like when it's associated with flooring. So you can go directly to the sections of the um, bar or um, where the rules are written, um, the IGCC section 801, to get the language that you might need for your contracts. Okay, there are two more sections of SF tool um, to cover. They're real quick though. The apply section is actually where you can find agency lessons and case studies and newsletters from federal agencies other than GSA. This is the system of record for the interagency sustainability working group. So I know we have non-GSA people on this call too. Um, the ISWG, which is the acronym for that because everything in government has acronyms, um, this is the system of record for the ISWG. So when there is a presentation that occurs at those essentially quarterly meetings, it's stored here. And so it allows for a great breadth of policies and strategies, tools and training to be kept on SF tool that are federal government wide. The item to the right is the Facilities Management Institute and it's found under the train tab. And that's where facility managers largely can go to benchmark the skills that they know. This is a series of uh, open book quizzes that are all online, all through SF Tool, that use SF Tool as the open book for taking a test to figure out where do you have knowledge gaps in managing a modern federal building. And then what the tool allows supervisors to do is identify free training that's out there for feds to fill those gaps. So it's a way of making sure that the federal facility managers are meeting the, um, the FBPTA, which is the Federal Buildings Personnel Training Act, which says we need to keep our folks trained in order to manage our buildings. There's a lot of phenomenal information there. And if you work for the government, you have full access to that, whether or not you are a building manager. Okay, I'm going to cover one more thing before we'll go on a 10 minute break and I'll throw it back to David before we do that. Um, we consistently create new pages in SF tool based on hot topics. Um, Melissa mentioned the PFAS page or the, what I always call PFAS forever plastics, the ones that never go away and that a lot of government right now are going, we really need to act on this quickly. So that page is actually a huge thing because people want good guidance about how to get better at avoiding chemicals of concern or plastics that don't ever degrade um, that are microplastics as well. Um, decarbonization is another topic like that. So when it comes to decarbonization, we tend to think about uh, emissions and greenhouse gases as um, something that we wanna mitigate, something that we need to slow down, that's something that we need to stop even and they also adapt to. So decarbonization or reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning and the amount of uh, greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere is a huge task. So what we did recently, and this is on demo today, is we've created a three-part decarbonization page that defines all the terms, starting with those big ones in the left-hand corner, like life cycle carbon, et cetera. Also talks about operational carbon, the carbon that we use in actually running buildings or uh, anything, which really talk about uh, energy efficiency and using carbon-free electricity. A lot of things that you're probably reading about if you ever pick up an issue of GovExec or look at policies coming out. Um, and we associate all of these things with tools and resources to help you do that. But the one part that really dovetails with the world of procurement is embodied carbon. Um, and it's buying products with lower embodied carbon materials. And 
that is something that you will find right smack in the middle of the table of contents for the embodied carbon section. Um, there are certain materials that we know today have environmental product declarations that show that they are using substantially less carbon in what they need to be created, like mining, manufacturing, transportation of that thing to the final site. And it is our job as procurement folks to know what those things are. Uh, and the sooner we know what they are and how we might be able to make effective choices to avoid those things with high embodied carbon, the better. So this is another page that's just on demo now, but going to be live very soon that would be useful to you. Um, so with that, I think my next step would be to go from macro to micro and show you how product search works. So this is a good time for our first break. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Lots of great information about the SF tool. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a few minutes. Uh, let's return at 10 minutes after the hour and resume. You have time to go freshen your coffee. Uh, this is great information. I can't, I'm looking forward to the next hour. So uh, with that, take a break.
All right, looks like it's about 10 minutes after the hour. Hopefully everybody has refreshed their cup of coffee and uh, ready for the next hour. Uh, really appreciate uh, your uh, rejoining us uh, this morning. We're talking all things sustainability uh, with Michael Bloom. Uh, he's outline, outlining uh, the sustainable uh, facilities tool or SF tool. Uh, we are a reminder, uh, we are recording uh, today's session. And Michael, before we get started, a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Karen Beyer, Customer Service Director down in San Antonio, has suggested that we might want to work with you all on adding uh, this uh, information, uh, these uh, kind of we have a, a, a web page called Acquisition Planning Packages, uh, which shares uh, planning package, packages with uh, uh, customers uh, to help them, uh, you know, plan their uh, their future acquisitions. And I think that uh, I don't think that we have any information uh, on this particular topic area uh, on that page. So we may want to add that for the future. That's excellent. And that's a great outcome from trainings like this. And we're always open to more linkages to uh, existing resources. Yes, sir. Shall we? Absolutely. OK, great. So we've covered sftool.gov writ large. We've covered the GPC specifically. Now we're going to go from the GPC, same starting point that uh, Melissa I, uh, shared with you to SF tool product search. And it's my goal here today to show you how you can follow all the rules that you can find in uh, the green procurement compilation that are all in one place, regardless of which agency owns the rule, um, and make it easy for you to do procurement. I'll also actually show you how we are already enabling elements of reporting that make that part of your jobs easier. Uh, and um, then after I cover the SF tool product search, I'll show you um, I'll, I'll show you the actual uh, procurement professional user guide, and it's a great review of what we covered here today. So if you're like, oh, that was a lot of stuff, I have no idea how to find it again. My goal there is to make sure that that's not the issue when we leave today, um, so that you feel comfortable not only that you learn that. There are resources, but that you can find them yourself. Okay, so when it comes to the Procure tab, that's where we are. It takes you to the GPC. And then um, if we go to the product categories, we already covered the fact that there are 27 main product categories, each with their own set of rules and applicable eco-labels. For instance, when we have uh, furniture that we wish to purchase, there are 12 plus, actually, 12 different types of federal programs and EPA specification standards and eco-labels that apply to furniture. Those include, I actually blew up the relatively small list on the left, on the right, so you can actually read them. So federal programs include CPG and BioPreferred. Now, I know most of you, especially if you're federal government folks, know BioPreferred quite well. It is the one program that there are le legal reporting requirements to report how much uh, every agency is buying of the BioPreferred products each year. The CPG program is administered by EPA, and essentially that is our recycled content standard. Now, the difference between CPG and BioPreferred is quite extensive. BioPreferred is a very well-funded and supported program by the U.S. Department of Agriculture with reporting requirements. CPG is a set of relatively old requirements for um, recycled content in multiple kinds of products. And the CPG also doesn't have a product registry. Um, that's an important concept here because anytime we have a certification system, whether it's a federal program or an eco-label, essentially businesses pay uh, to have their products certified. That's a, done by a third party organization or sometimes agency that certifies that the information they gave them is correct. It's a difference between 
a vendor actually saying, yeah, our light bulb is water sense certified, which sometimes happens. Water doesn't apply to light bulbs, just in case you missed that. Um, so we don't want that kind of stuff happening. So we care about federal programs and eco-labels because not only do they help a third party tell us, hey, this stuff is real, but when they exist, they actually provide databases, those registries, of all the information the manufacturers who made the stuff actually gave the certification body, which is really useful information to figure out whether it meets or exceeds certain standards. And it also allows us to buy the best stuff because we have the data. The challenge that we have with uh, programs that have no registry is we have no data. And so I wanted to make it clear here that sometimes doing the right thing when it comes to sustainable, sustainable procurement is hard because even if you're trying to do all the right things, it's really hard to find the data. So um, by showing you just this first screen of building uh, furnishings and furniture and showing you how many different eco-labels are at play here, the great thing is all of these different labels have some element of data that they help us with, um, other than programs like CPG, which don't have a registry. Um, and when we have that data, we can actually work towards figuring out how to compare uh, products on multiple attributes in real time. And this is products like brand name will name products themselves, not just product categories. So it helps you figure out which things are the best performing items out there on the market. Now, what we also realize here is that if there are 12 different eco-labels that we're supposed to use to the maximum extent practicable, um, that's a lot of clicks to go from um, the recommendations that you find here to figuring out, well, what are the products that comply with those? And so what we thought is we don't want you to end up on a page of rules and then get stuck and throw up your hands and say, I can't figure out where to go next. So we wanted to provide guardrails or even more appropriately bumpers in a bowling alley so that when you were to do a procurement and choose from what we were able to show you, they'd be guaranteed to hit pins at the end of that, uh, at that bowling lane um, so that you would be able to keep going and actually um, execute a sustainable procurement. So what we did is we took the federal programs, those programs like Energy Star and Water Sense and Safer Choice and BioPreferred, and we took the third-party eco-labels and certifications like Cradle to Cradle or EPEAT or Declare, and we grabbed all the data that we could from those two. And then we said, you know what, even when you have registry registries, um, EP and uh, Energy Star don't require a manufacturer to send them a picture. If you're thinking like a person doing market research, you are very used to seeing photos of the item that you're looking for, even if just to check that it's the item you mean to be searching for. So we um, gathered manufacturer provided data, not to say they're certified or not, that would be self-certification, that's what we're seeking to avoid, but just to supplement the information we've already got in terms of data um, to create the largest curated database of compliant high performance products in the marketplace. And what we did is we focused on 15 of the 27 product categories, which gave us over 4,500 brands and 20 plus eco labels and certifications and over 150,000 different products that we could create a essentially a online catalog of compliant products that met the, spe the specifications and the rules that we have in the GPC. And that's what we call SF tool product search. And the way you go from the GPC to SF tool product search, a picture of which you see on the right, is the binoculars that you'll find in any page that is one of those 15 different product categories that are covered. And so I'm gonna show you several examples of how we go from the GPC pages that Melissa um, covered earlier to actual product search and what you get there. Again, this is also a free tool for anybody who's looking to buy. And this is a tool that makes a lot of sense for people who are uh, doing procurements, whether they're project managers or not, to share with their contractors and even the contractors' subcontractors, because they can all see the same sets of products, all of which comply with what our sustainability goals are. Um, 
So let's see what that looks like. With monitors, with computer monitors, there are actually two different eco-labels that are in play. One is a federal program, right, Energy Star, and the second is EPEAT, which is an international standard. Now for EPEAT, EPEAT is a multi-attribute eco-label. That means it looks at more than one attribute. It's not just looking at energy efficiency, for instance. It's looking at where is this made? How sustainable are its parts? How much recycled content might be in a monitor? Those kinds of elements matter to the EPEAT label. It's a, it's a great example of a multi-attribute label that helps balance a lot of different sustainability and responsible business conduct attributes. So um, knowing that, finding products that comply with both could be a multi-step process for you. You could look at Energy Star. You could look at a general buy site and just check for the Energy Star label. You can even do that very well on uh, GSA Advantage. Um, you could then do the same thing with EP. Um, now notice that the EP rule for monitors says highest rating available. Now EP monitors are rated as um, gold, silver, uh, yeah, bronze, gold, and silver, um, and gold is the highest. So essentially, if we are a federal government agency, we should be buying Energy Star EP Gold monitors. So you could do all the research yourself, or you could click on the binoculars and be taken automatically to a page that sorts by those two eco labels, that which would give you over sixty brands and over sixteen hundred products for those that met just EP and Energy Star. Um, then that page lets you search for those things just like you would as a normal buyer. What size monitor did you want? What resolution? What brands are in play? Um, I know we do not buy by brands generally. We sometimes say X or X equivalent. But what I love about this tool is it shows that not only are there products that comply with these rules, but there are many products from many brands, which makes this a very useful tool, not only for buyers, um, but also, and also to convince people, hey, look, there lot, there's lots of um, market competition here, but it's a great useful tool for policymakers so that make sure, hey, before we set a policy, let's make sure there are products at the end of that rainbow. And this is just one example. So monitors, we go from the GPC examples of Energy Star and EPEAT, those specific programs that are required, and then we filter down automatically to the monitors that um, fulfill that. And then you can go even more fine-tuned. I'll give you the fine-tuned example with furniture um, from there. What's next? Cleaning supplies. Uh, Melissa mentioned that cleaning supplies have like five... 500 pages of content. That's because we have subcategories for cleaning supplies, um, thanks to the way that we're taking many rules from many agencies, um, down to things like bathroom and spa cleaners. So this is the bathroom and spa cleaner example. And when it comes to that, the active recommendations on the GPC are FP, which is the Federal Biopreferred Program, uh, Federal Purchasing Program for Biopreferred. That's one thing, so it needs to be bio-based. And it even says 74% bio-based content or more. Safer Choice is also there. That's the one I mentioned that's formally designed for the environment. And then you have EPA recommended labels of Green Seal, GS37, and EcoLogo UL. Now, for those of you who are just buying cleaning products, you're like, how in the world am I supposed to know all of those things? Well, one, if you need to know more about any of those programs, just click on the GPC link that's right here. But two, if you just need to find products that comply with those things, click on the binoculars and you get a pre-sorted list of all four of those eco labels being active, 60 plus brands and over 450 products in bathroom and spa cleaners alone. Um, and then you can sort further from there. In any of the pages on SF Tool product search, next to a label like BioPreferred, there's a parenthetical statement, and the parentheses capture exactly how many of the products are um, in that page that you're looking at are BioPreferred. So there's 184 different BioPreferred products on this page, 110 different Safer Choice certified, and you can click the box and just find the thing that is uh, consistent with that particular eco-label. 
Again, this is us using public data for the most part and organizing it in a way that makes your job easier. One more example, I said we would go into furniture. So here are those 12 different um, requirements that we're supposed to maximize the use of. And when we click the binoculars, we get over 100 brands and over 32,000 products. Now I recognize that when you're looking for furniture, you care about buying chairs, not just any furniture, or you care about desks, et cetera. So we let you sort by that too. Um, and let me show you how it looks when you go into this more deeply. Here's the first step. We should already covered this. Step one, go to GPC and then click the binoculars. Step two, click, click the binoculars. You get the view of all of the furniture. And you get to see out of all the results available, how many are actually complying with each of these different eco-labels that are active there. With an additional filter selected, you can actually select your product type and subtype. So like chair and then a task chair. Um, and then even things like brand and figure out which um, for any um, eco-label that has multiple levels like gold, silver, bronze for EP, or in this case, BIFMA level, which is the national uh, furniture industry standard, um, whether it's level one, two, or three, you can click that to basically optimize the filter, get the very best performing sustainable things. And then on top of that, sorry, on top of that, you have the ability sometimes to search for additional filters that are beyond the EPA recommended eco labels because they're, they're based on data that we have for things like environmental product declarations or health product declarations, or even things that are under GSA contract. So that's all available to you on SF Tool product search. And notice all these pictures. Each one of these pictures you can click on and get all the detail we have about that item. And these are brand name products um, in our system. So you can see that. You can also choose to compare multiple products against one another all in one view. And that is a really useful thing for putting together your um, market research. I'll show you how that works. The way that we do that is that when you turn over that card, in this case for a human scale chair, um, I was a project manager for many years before I have the role I have now. And my job was to um, collect this kind of data. Before I've even bought anything, all of the certificates that actually um, prove that this chair is as sustainable as it claims are linked to that card. So you have that data and, the, and that documentation before you even uh, buy it, um, which is great. And that's how we automate our ability to compare things. So you're not only able to find products that comply, but you're able to find all the data that says, prove it to me. You can build a for free still, build a project, just to establish um, a login and build a project and put the number of each kinds of things that you're looking to buy. And it will actually um, compare that to the federal guidelines, every, all the rules on the GPC and give you a PDF that's active that, um, that you can share with your whole team. And it can show you um, not only how it's compared it, how it complies with federal guidelines, but how it might comply with any rate, green building rating systems that the project that you're procuring items for uh, seeking to meet. And here's the, what it looks like when you compare four different chairs together. You're, all of the attributes are lined up, a lot like what you saw in SF Tool uh, itself on that material comparison for flooring. But this time we're using all of the eco-label data that we've got to show how they perform across multiple attributes. And again, this is a PDF that's shareable and can serve as documentation for your market research for any procurement. Now, one thing that's really cool is because we have all the data about all of the products, when it's a product that's not furniture, when it's a product that actually either uses water like faucets or um, shower heads or uh, uses electricity like monitors or um, let's say clothes dryer or light bulbs, we actually can model how quickly that green product pays for itself in terms of operational costs. In other words, building in a life cycle calculator for you. 
So this is an example of saying, hey, when you're even just doing research and you find this LED bulb, you figure out that that LED bulb by going by figuring out the name of the LED bulb and then going to a purchasing site. That's not what SF Tool does, but going to a purchasing site to grab the price. That that bulb costs twelve dollars and thirty eight cents, and it is going to and you can put in your energy use in region seven, for instance, and you set we these come preset, but you can always change anything that's in these boxes. How many hours a day is your building operational? How much might it cost to install the bulbs, right? We put a cost there. And then what is the this new relatively expensive bulb replacing? Well, it's replacing $102 60 watt bulbs. And we see that even though it's six times more expensive, that this chart will show that in terms of energy savings, this more these 100 bulbs will pay for themselves in less than five and a half months. Again, for anything with energy or water use, before you even buy, this tool allows you to see the payback of when are you going to get the return on investment for buying the sustainable thing. And I think that's a really great thing for you all to have at your fingertips. I know I'm uh, running short on time. I'm just going to go for about four more minutes, if that's okay. Um, I mentioned that we are able to do reporting using this engine. We have tested a pilot project with Sandia National Labs, which remarkably is in your region, um, that says, hey, what if we were able to have every buyer of anything for Sandia National Labs um, use the tool and then automatically have all of those purchases roll up to the one person who needs to do reporting for the labs each year. And they have full insight into how, mu how much of the total spend was actually done sustainably. Well, we can do that when people use this tool to um, do their market research with a couple extra add-ons. And so this is a um, service that GSA is offering to federal agencies. And essentially it allows us to include everybody from contractors and subcontractors using the same tool. It aggregates all the data, it identifies the com compliant products, um, it provides the discipline of reporting requirements, but it also, if you use the tool, it's all packaged there already. I just showed you how everything just rolls up because it knows the data behind the stuff you're buying. And it's flexible for future needs, including additional categories like environmental, environmentally preferable products and that low embodied carbon kind of category I mentioned earlier. And it can even help us implement and make quick progress on new categories like eliminating those PFAS uh, or uh, buying local. So reporting feature, an additional add-on, not free for um, everybody now, but something that is built upon the engine that I just showed you, which is known as SF Tool Product Search. Um, so here's a slide that says, hey, everything Michael just said. Um, there for future posterity. I promised you that I would give you an overview of saying, hey, let me make sure that you can find all the resources that Melissa and I have covered if you're on your own. And that's the procurement professional uh, user guide. This is what the first page of the user guide looks like. I'm switching gears here to user guides for my last couple of minutes. So the user guides are built on us saying, hey, if you are a procurement professional, you care about these top three things, you care about value-based purchasing, not just first cost, right? You care about following all the regulations and compliance, and you care about identifying sustainable products and procuring them, right? So how do you use this tool to do that? Next, as you slide down the user guide, basically we list the things that are an SF tool that help you do the value-based purchasing. And as you hover over or click on each one of these sentences, like, Explore GSA lessons learned on collaborative strategies for procurement professionals. The page to the right changes to the actual page in SF tool that you should go to. If you actually click, hard click on the link, it'll take you there right away. And then you use your front and back arrows if you want to just explore between the, um, the user guide and the tool itself. 
And so we walk you through each one, like the compare materials and systems. I showed you how that works. That's where you'd find it. Or understanding how purchases can impact both human and natural resources. That's the explore section I talked about. But you don't need to know that. All you need to do is walk your way through the user guide and you can find that again. And as you go down a little bit further, insurance purchases are federal or FAR compliant. We show you where you find those resources in SF tool, um, just step by step. And then aligning those procurements with the guidance. Here's how you would do that with the, the resources that Melissa covered. Some of them are in the buy, some of them are in vendor, et cetera. Oops. And then when it comes to identifying those sustainable products and services, that's where you'll get links to the GPC and SF tool product search the kinds of stuff that I've just covered now. So make that procurement professional user guide your friend, or just use the search box in SF tool to be able to find all of these things. In final, this is that summary slide. Notice the LinkedIn uh, uh, address to follow us on S SF tool on social media. And now I believe you know about SF tool, more than 86% of you, you can search it first, you can share it with friends, you can use it to make your work simpler, and you can engage with us moving forward. Um, we all have we, we have sftool at gsa.gov, by the way, um, if you want to let us know um, to continue to improve this tool to be a better service to you. And that's it. Wow, Michael, that's a lot of information and some uh, great uh, content. Golly, uh, I think one of the things that struck me the most is uh, the ability to work with agencies uh, to help integrate uh, uh, the uh, kind of the uh, reporting aspects of SF tool uh, into their own organizational construct. That's great information. And uh, so they would, if people are interested in doing something like that, would they reach out to you? Yes. Uh, to do that? Yes. And if, if, if there are folks that have agency contacts, the way that works best is to go as high up in the individual agency as possible so that an agency can have that roll up for. Uh, as large a chunk of the agency as possible. That's great. Thank you. Um, so there was a, a, a question that uh, came back through again. What was the statement made about commercial items uh, pertaining to waivers? Uh, did, did we answer that? I, th I think Melissa answered that. Yeah, it was kind of related to uh, uh, it's within agency policy. So whatever agency you work with, that's where you would find the waiver process if there is a waiver. Right. And yeah. there were those attributes. Melissa, did you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah, the exceptions are um, for using environmentally preferable products or if the product does not meet performance needs are not reasonably available or only available at an unreasonable price. And the there's also um, further exception authority in FAR part 23.105. Great. Um, Michael, uh, some feedback from Brian Hogan. It's rare to find a presenter with the knowledge, credibility, and enthusiasm all in one package. Michael Bloom gets it. So uh, that's great feedback. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Let's see. Any? I'm just scanning to see if there are any questions, more questions before moving on. Candace DeSantis, is there anything in the SF tool that specifically addresses alternatives to single-use plastic products? And we answered that in the chat, but I wanted to give a shout out to Candice for asking a great question that really all of us at GSA are like, yeah, we should create a single resource that shows the status of that question. We are grappling with that 
seriously now. And we sometimes mention that like, have your furniture shipped blanket covered instead of in plastic or in boxes, that kind of thing. And I know many GSA offices always already do that, but consolidating information about how to eliminate single use plastics, how to put that into contracts, things like that. That's something that the uh, GSA acquisition uh, or federal acquisition uh, policy group, it's a um, federal um, advisory committee pointed out in very strong language that um, they'd like to see GSA pursue and the federal government pursue. So I'll keep my eye on that and post resources as they are ready uh, to meet what Candace has identified as a great need. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, so I didn't see any other questions out there. Any other questions? Uh, if not, we're gonna go ahead and uh, turn the mic over to uh, to Katie Miller, uh, she's going to talk to us about climate risk. Great, thank you. I uh, can. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, ma'am. We well, sure can. Great, thank you. So, um, I have the very unenviable unenvi position of going after Michael, who, as others have noted, is an amazing speaker. Um, I will try and keep up with him as best as I can, but I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody for having me here today. So I'm Katie Miller. I'm the Senior Leader for Climate uh, for GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, and today I'm going to discuss, I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the focusing on the tools that we have, but very related to those, um, discussing the Federal Climate and Sustainability Initiatives. Um, that are currently out there, how GSA and particularly FAS is supporting those efforts and helping our customers to meet their climate and sustainability requirements, as well as what um, is also being proposed and might be coming down the line a bit in this space as well. Um, uh, for those of us that work in FAS, we know that our commissioner, one of his North Star goals is to make it dead easy to do business with FAS. And so I'm always trying to think, how do we do that from the climate and sustainability perspective? Um, so let's start just briefly uh, with an overview of climate change and, and why it matters in the context of federal procurement. And um, what you'll see here and what I'm going to talk about, you can always go back to the SF tools, the climate literacy page to kind of refresh on this and get more information. But I thought it would be helpful to really talk about when we say climate change, what, what do we mean and, and why is this a crisis and why are we addressing it through uh, federal acquisition? So Let's first start with weather. So weather is what you see happening outside your window right now, whether the sun's shining, it's raining, whether it's hot or cold. I know for those of you in the South, there's a heat wave going on right now. There's been some, a lot of storms and tornadic activity over the last 24 hours. I hope everybody's doing well and safe. But what you see look out your window right now, it really depends on where you live. And we generally expect certain types of weather at certain times of the year. And it's these long-term weather patterns that are considered the expected climate for a given location. So when we use the term climate change, what we're really referring to are long-term changes that are happening in those average and expected weather patterns. The things that we really expect to see weather-wise outside our window. Um, and you'll frequently hear climate change being discussed in terms of how much warmer the planet is becoming. And the picture that you see here um, shows one example of this. The Muir Glacier in Alaska was frozen uh, during the summer back in 1941. And you can see how 63 years later in 2004, and that's almost 20 years ago now, um, it's now melted in spots during the summer. And uh, these types of consistent and concerning changes that we see in our climate have led uh, the current administration to start referring to climate change as a crisis. So why does this matter? It really matters because the federal government is the owner of a significant number of assets, and all of us on here are very well aware of this, right? From buildings and land to IT equipment and vehicles, we spend about $650 billion every year in goods and services. And that is that number. Every time I say it, it's just, it, it's a, that's a big one. So how we spend this money and what we spend it on can really greatly impact the climate change crisis. Um, and the requirements that we have in the federal government for climate and sustainability through executive orders, regulations, and statutes, they can help to both reduce the federal government's impact on the environment and, and to protect these assets that we're spending all this money on from the impacts 
of climate change as well. So just wanted to briefly kind of run through, there's four executive orders that the Biden-Harris administration has issued and signed. Um, and these really direct the federal government to take action. Um, the first executive order really made it a priority for federal agencies to immediately take action to improve the environment, including by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing our resilience to the impacts of climate change. Um, the second executive order, this one directed agencies to use the power of procurement, so right in our swim lane here today, to make the federal government climate ready and to create climate adaptation plans for each agency to ensure that this change in climate that we're seeing does not impede the ability of agencies to meet their missions. Uh, the third executive order, 14030, directed agencies to examine and address the financial risks that are associated with climate change. So climate change isn't just about um, you know, the impacts to our assets, but also about how it can impact us uh, financially, um, including through our procurements and supply chain. Uh, and the fourth executive order here, it directs uh, federal agencies to reduce their emissions and climate risks across federal operations, um, including supply chains. And one of the big goals in here is to target to reach net zero emissions procurement by 2050. So that's a big one that we need to think about how we're going to address. And again, I wanted to really focus on that procurement is looked at as a tool to address climate risk and to make the government more climate ready. Um, Executive Order 14008 really notes that federal agencies must develop climate action plans um, and adaptation plans and to use that power of procurement to create a climate ready government. Um, and again, uh, the financial impacts of supply uh, of climate change that seeps down into the financial stability of our nation as well as our supply chains. Um, so this is something that we're focusing on and looking into as well. So when we talk about climate change, how do we address it? What does this mean? Um, so there's two types of actions to address climate change and the requirements that we have in the executive orders. These two actions that you see here, they're not federal specific. They're actions that any type of organization across the globe can take to address climate change. Uh, so the first focuses on sustainability and greenhouse gas management. And this is about reducing our impact on the environment. And this, we do this by reducing harmful emissions, purchasing sustainable products and services using the GPC and the SF tool to identify those sorts of things and reducing waste. The second action is climate adaptation and risk management. And this is really about how do we reduce that change in climate's impact on us? So how do we start preparing for increased fires, floods, drought, and extreme temperatures. And for FAS, a lot of this is about how do we make sure that we're preparing for those so that our supply chain is also less likely to break down from those impacts. Um, so while we have sustainability and climate adaptation, they're two distinct responses to climate change, they do impact one another. So the more we can really reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and waste, the less we will need to adapt. And why this is important is because the less we need to adapt, the less money and resources we, our customer agencies and our industry partners will need to spend on kind of shoring up our supply chains. And this also all links to uh, the federal sustainability plan. And this was created as part of executive order 14057 that I just went over. And this is for all of the government. This is the first time we've really had a sustainability plan for all of the government, not just individual agencies. And it calls for sustainability, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and climate adaptation and risk management actions, as well as to develop a workforce that's focused um, on climate and sustainability as well. So it's great to have these sessions because that's one another yet another way we can help to build that workforce. So that's a little bit of background there. I did wanna walk you through some current initiatives and really kind of from an acquisition regulation standpoint, um, what are current regulations that we have um, within the federal acquisition regulations and the GSA acquisition regulations, in addition to the ones that um, Melissa talked about earlier that relate to green purchasing, and then some proposed regulations that are um, out there for public, that have been out there for public comment or we know are in development uh, there's three of those, and I'll walk you through what uh, to potentially expect with those, just to give you a sense of what's coming next. 
Um, so as Melissa talked about, we do have uh, FAR Part 23, and this uh, implements the federal sustainable acquisition requirements for items like energy and water efficient products. Um, and these have been required for the federal government to give preference to and purchase some for decades, um, particularly the recycled content products since the 1970s. Um, so a lot of these programs aren't new. Uh, GSA's green procurement compilation, is, as Melissa walked you through, it's publicly available and please use that to better understand these requirements and, and how they apply to specific products and services. Um, and we also ha now have, as Melissa mentioned, the buyer resources page that you can go to that walks you through that acquisition life cycle to get more information. So in terms of other acquisition regulations that are out there, in 2016, a new provision was added to FAR Part 52. And this is to collect information from offers on supplier greenhouse gas reporting. And this is done through their annual representations and certifications. So they go into the system for award management to update this on an annual basis. So this requirement um, is for offers who receive seven and a half million dollars or more in federal contracts in the prior fiscal year. They must represent whether they do or do not publicly disclose their greenhouse gas emissions um, or if they set a GHG emissions reduction goal. So this requirement does not impact the ability of a contractor to do business with the government. It's for information collection purposes only. So just answering these questions, whether it's a yes or a no meets the requirement. And I do wanna note that for offers below that seven and a half million dollar threshold, they can optionally choose to represent if they publicly disclose their emissions and a reduction goal as well. So this is one potential source of information on um, what suppliers are doing in this space. And if you're not familiar with greenhouse gas emissions, I wanted to take a moment to describe what this means. Uh, for accounting purposes, greenhouse gases are divided into three standard categories or what they call scopes. So scope one emissions, these are direct emissions from sources that are owned or controlled by an organization. So these are things like emissions from boilers and furnaces that are located in a, uh, an owned facility and emissions from owned vehicles. Scope two emissions are indirect greenhouse gas emissions, and they're associated with the purchase of electricity, steam, heat, or cooling. And while scope two emissions physically occur at a facility where, uh, where they're generated, they're still accounted for in an organization's uh, greenhouse gas inventory because they're a result of the organization's energy use. They're buying that energy from that source. And then scope three emissions, these are also indirect emissions and they're, they're from sources not owned or directly controlled by an organization, but they are related to organizational activities. So this is where things like, um, you account for things like employee travel and commuting, uh, delivery services, as well as supply chains and the emissions that come along with um, the, the manufacturing of supplies and services that we purchase in the federal government. So beyond those federal acquisition regulations, GSAs, uh, we have internal regulations, uh, as many of you know, that have been updated to support climate action as well. So there's three of those. The first one is in our uh, General Services Acquisition Manual, and it asks contracting officers to consider the environmental impacts in acquisition planning uh, and to promote the use of sustainable solutions in contract administration and examine environmental incomes, not just price alone. So Michael walked you through some of the great calculators he has um, and ways to look at that life cycle approach on this. And that's a great tool to help those in GSA uh, to, to, to uh, take action on, on this policy for our agency. We also have an acquisition letter that's encouraging us to use more innovative acquisition approaches uh, to increase our climate and sustainability through our procurements and ask that we document these for their effectiveness. So this is a great way for GSA for us to try different approaches to really improve climate and sustainability through our acquisition process. And by documenting it, we have, um, we're pulling together all that information and trying to see which of these are the most effective over time. And then finally, within the Federal Acquisition Service, the office that I'm in, the Office of Policy and Compliance, we have a policy and procedure that ensures all contracts that are valued at $100 million or more, so these are some of our major 
contracts are screened um, for all sorts of requirements, including greenhouse gas and climate risk management reporting um, and sustainable acquisition requirements. And so we're using that policy and procedure um, to add uh, supplier greenhouse gas and climate risk management reporting to some of our new contracts that are valued at $100 million or more. And this, is, uh, this effort is really directly supporting uh, the requirements in Executive Order 14057 uh, uh, to improve the sustainability of the federal supply chain. So through this process, contractors may be required to meet climate and sustainability uh, post-award deliverables. Uh, these include uh, submitting a greenhouse gas inventory and reduction target, as well as reporting on progress in meeting their target and then submitting a climate risk management plan. And that plan is really focused on reducing the impacts of climate change on the delivery of a product or service and reporting on that progress over the life of the contract. So this requirement is evolving, um, and this is, but this is now the current requirement for some of our, our new contracts. One thing I wanted to mention on this is that as we add these um, to at the master contract level through our acquisition vehicles at GSA, we're, we're, our, our goal really there is to add an umbrella of support for our customer agencies. Um, so while we're adding that into our master contract, um, our customer agencies can also then add more agency specific um, climate and sustainability requirements at the task order level under these acquisition vehicles. So you can look at your agency's sustainability and climate adaptation plans to see what your agency is committed to in terms of creating a more sustainable and climate ready supply chain within your agency. And that can give you some ideas about what you may need to add at the task order level um, as a customer agency. So while that's what we're doing right now, I did want to kind of leave you as well with some information on, on three new uh, FAR cases that are currently under development, and these are being driven by executive order requirements. Um, so the first, the first FAR case that you see there um, on the left is uh, focused on requiring major suppliers to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions and climate-related financial risk and to set science-based uh, targets. These would be a requirement of doing business with the federal government um, above certain dollar thresholds. So the status of that one right now, it is that um, a public comment period went out on this and uh, the FAR team is currently reviewing the comments that they received through that process. Um, the second one here on minimizing the risk of climate change in federal acquisitions, this is really focused on ensuring that major agency procurements minimize the risk of climate change and to consider the social costs of greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, the status on that one is there was an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking that was published back in October of 2021, and um, they got a lot of comments through that process, and they're working on drafting a proposed rule. And then finally, this last one here, which really kind of ties into what um, Michael and Melissa have presented on earlier today, is focused on sustainable procurement. And this is really a comprehensive rewrite of that FAR Part 23 we've talked about to streamline it and provide some more clear messaging and direction on sustainable federal procurement. And they're currently drafting that proposed rule as well. If you ever wanna check in and see where these are, this link that I have here um, will give you an update. It's about every two weeks, I think it gets updated. So you can see where any of these are in the process at any given time. So that's what is um, coming down the pike um, potentially. So I did wanna leave you with a couple of resources before I go. Um, the first one, I'm gonna walk through two of them specifically is a framework for managing climate risks to federal supply chains. So this um, is a part of the sustainable facilities tool and GSA developed this um, supply chain risk management framework and it's focused on the US uh, federal acquisition workforce and for their use. So it's, it's primarily used as um, an educational tool and what it helps agencies do is to walk through from a supply chain perspective, what are to help them identify what the climate risks are in their supply chain, um, assess those risks, including what's the likelihood of the risks, uh, what are the potential consequences of these risks, um, and then helps them to develop a plan, what can be done to reduce the, these uh, risks, um, 
And then finally also walks you through how to monitor and modify um, your approach moving forward based off of more information that you collect. So this is a tool that we can, um, we can point our um, federal agency customers to. And I couldn't, I couldn't not mention, of course, market research as a service. This is a case tool, it's awesome. I've used it before in acquisitions. I know others in the agency who have. Um, it's a great tool. It's free for our customers, anybody in the federal government to use. Um, and the reason why I bring it up here is for when you're conducting an RFI or quest for information, we we're just talking about climate risk and climate adaptation. And there's a lot of agencies, I think, who still are trying to understand what does that mean? How does this apply to a supply chain? But they may know that, you know, I'm I'm buying a, a mission critical product or service through the and uh, through this RFI. I want to find out if um, there are suppliers out there that can address climate risk in the delivery of this product or service. So we worked with Case. Case has done a great job of providing some kind of standard questions you can easily add to your RFI. And we developed a couple on climate risk and climate adaptation. And there's three open-ended questions here that um, anyone going through the MRF process can add to their RFI, including whether uh, suppliers have conducted climate vulnerability assessments to address their risks of climate change, what their, um, if they developed a plan to address those, and then how they're monitoring those risks as well. And then, um, and then finally, I did want to leave you with some other resources. A lot of these have already been talked about um, with Michael and Melissa, the climate terminology page on the SF tool, uh, the federal sustainability plan that I mentioned earlier today, a website that talks all about GSA's specific actions on climate and sustainability. Uh, there is a GSA federal contractor climate action scorecard that you can take a look at. Um, this is generated out of Michael's office. It's great. You can take a quick look and see every year for an update um, what uh, some of the largest contractors in the federal government are doing in terms of climate sustainability. We have that buyer, resource, buyer resources page on the GPC. And then also, of course, what I just talked about with um, MRADs and the climate risk questions and how to access those. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that was helpful for you. Thank you all so much for having me here today. You can always reach out if you have any questions. Um, and thanks so much. Hey, Katie, thank you so <laughs> much. Great information. I really, the, uh, the market research as a service uh, plug is really uh, so important uh, to our customers. Thanks for that. I I kind of would think, boy, this could be a set of three boilerplate questions that we ask every time we do a market research uh, effort, whether you're doing it, uh, whether the customers are doing it, uh, you know, for your agency, even in the open market. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, if you're uh, considering using a GSA contract, uh, these are, are questions that you could easily integrate in uh, to every uh, market research that you do. Let me see if we have any questions out here. Let's see, another great presentation. You're getting some great comments, uh, very helpful. Uh, great presentation, uh, another great presentation, such wonderful speakers and valuable information. Any questions out there for Katie? If not, why don't we go ahead and uh, ask Katie to uh, stop presenting, that way I can present. Uh, let's see, don't know if this pertains. So Priscilla Torres asked, I don't know if this pertains to this presentation, but are there any recycling programs for ink? Anybody want to take that? I think that some manufacturers have, uh, there's take back programs for the ink cartridges for printers um, through some of the managed print service contracts. I believe some of those are built in, um, but that's a great question and I should re-familiarize myself with that. Not to put anybody on the spot. So over the weekend, I replaced my uh, ink cartridges in my personal 
printer. And yes, Katie's exactly right. Inside the package uh, was an envelope that I was conveniently able to uh, insert the old uh, uh, cartridges, seal it up and send it postage paid back to uh, a recycler. So yeah, Michael. I, was, I was going to step in and also say for recycling programs, that's one of the uh, initiatives that is best handled at the local level, almost always, aside from those manufacturer take back programs. So look at even your city resources for programs if you don't have something, if you have items and you're like, there must be a way to recycle this. Sometimes I, I live in Chicago, I need to drop off my excess paint, even if it's the, the low VOC paint at a single site that's in this huge city, right? But I do that. And I do the same with my used monitors and things like that as well. So um, we are increasingly trying to show where those resources are, but because they vary so significantly from region to region and city to city, it's really awesome to use your most local resources when it comes to recycling. That's great information. Thank you, Michael, for that. We're going to go ahead and pause, uh, give everybody a chance to, again, refresh their cup of coffee. Uh, we have one final hour uh, with Mr. Brian Booth from the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, uh, talking about uh, professional services in this arena. Uh, so uh, let's just look at the clock if we can, uh, make this one a little shorter and be back at uh, you know, about uh, 12 minutes past the hour, and we'll resume uh, at that point. So we're on break.
Brian Booth, are you uh, here with us? Yes, sir, I am. Awesome, great. What a great morning it's been. It has been. Thank you so much for everybody who's uh, sticking with us as we talk all things uh, sustainability and procurement. Uh, our final hour is with Mr. Brian Booth from the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories. He's going to talk to us about uh, some of the contracts that they offer uh, that help us uh, in this arena. So without further ado, take it away, Earth Muffin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave, Earth Muffin. I haven't been called that in a long time, but at one point that was a nickname that did get tossed around. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. I think I'll have to stop sharing, Dave. Uh, but uh, what a great morning it's been so far. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, the information that Melissa, Michael, and Katie have shared um, because they have a wealth of information. Uh, here we go, I'm pulling this up right now. Uh, so uh, I love the tools that uh, they've been able to build around uh, sustainable acquisition and procurement. Uh, and the presentation from Katie, I find especially helpful because there are some uh, major changes going on right now in, in, with regards to regulations and rules pertaining to acquisition um, that have impacts on how we do things in a more greener manner uh, for the federal government. So uh, great stuff. Uh, I, I have, I'm here to talk about professional services and environmental services in particular. Um, that's part of the portfolio that I represent, the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital. Uh, and we do offer uh, some environmental services. So if you are part of an agency that is trying to acquire services, not necessarily products, but those can be also sometimes part of a solution, uh, there are ways to, to get to that. Um, so Dave, just quick audio check. Can you see my screen? I can. All right, perfect. I love it when technology works. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about what environmental services really are, uh, because that sometimes is a tricky definition, and then what we should be considering when it comes to acquiring environmental services as part of category management and how they're defined a little bit further. Also, what the federal acquisition profile looks like in regards to environmental services, because uh, that can be a, a bit, I guess, telling sometimes uh, when it comes to how much money we spend as the federal government on environmental services. Uh, and then we'll talk about the solutions that Dave mentioned, the contract programs that my portfolio manages and maintains. Uh, and then at the, hopefully at the end, we'll have some Q&A time and discussion, as Dave mentioned earlier, um, for any kind of more open-ended questions that you may have had during all the presentations this morning. Uh, so first of all, what are environmental services exactly? Uh, when, I, when I hear environmental, instantly my mind goes to an image similar to what Katie showed, you know, comparing the, the glacier from 1941 to 2004, uh, quite a bit of difference. You know, how do we save those those uh, small ecological areas that are very susceptible to climate change? But the federal government, when it comes to procuring environmental services, uh, does a lot more variety and breadth of, of type of service uh, in supporting their agency missions than just that. Uh, so primarily, when we talk about environmental services, most of us think of environmental consulting. You know, having somebody come in and provide us a better idea of how maybe we can manage thing in a greener manner. Maybe they can help us do better sustainable procurement. Uh, but also there's environmental engineering. So if you have projects that uh, you need to take into consideration, in particular environmental aspects of, maybe you need an engineering firm to help develop a bioswale plan for a new facility that you're gonna build. Um, then there's also the remediation and reclamation uh, these are uh, very major projects across the country uh, where we're cleaning up the environment that we've somehow polluted or damaged uh, based off of either industry or uh, sometimes in some cases just the public has damaged it with illegal dumping and that type of fun stuff. Um, so those are, that's, those are some of the three big areas, but there's a lot more a type of service that people consider or the federal government considers environmental services, um, including hazmat managing, of course, uh, but also environmental emergency response. That's one of the EPA's primary missions in many cases is how do we respond in an environmental emergency if there's a, a major catastrophe like a hurricane or wildfire. Uh, there's also the, the detailed kind of remediation and reclamation, like how do we get rid of storage tanks that could pollute the groundwater? 
Um, I live in Washington State. Hanford is a major Superfund site here. And uh, guess what? Plutonium waste was stored in underground storage tanks for years after World War II and after the Cold War. And we're still dealing with that today. Uh, but there's more to it than just that. Also, fleet electric, electrification planning, facilities type planning. How do we make things more efficient, more uh, less resource intensive, decarbonize uh, some of our systems and buildings and infrastructure? Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to what environmental services really are. And it's really kind of hard to define that. Uh, part of the reason it's hard to define that is because there is this thing called government-wide category management. Within government-wide category management, there isn't a large category labeled environmental. Um, in fact, there's not even a subcategory labeled environmental. Instead, what we have is we have things like professional services as one large category. Facilities and construction is another large category. Research and development um, is actually a, a DOD category. Uh, but these are some of the ways that the government categorizes all these types of services, but there really isn't one that's specifically for environmental services. Uh, there are, though, a few other ways that the federal government defines types of services and products for that matter, but I'm gonna focus on services. Uh, and that is by the use of a NAICS code, so the North American Industrial Classification Code, or a product and service code, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but let's talk about NAICS codes first, because when it comes to acquiring services, if you're a contracting officer or a contract specialist, or even a program manager that's in charge of a program and you're working closely with your acquisition uh, at workforce, uh, then you probably need to know what the definitions of NAICS codes are or have some awareness of what they mean. Uh, so in the case of environmental services, there's really only one NAICS code that is specifically called out as environmental, and that is 541620 for environmental consulting services. But as I just showed you on the previous slide, there's lots of other ways that the federal government talks about environmental requirements. Um, so I kind of think of the, those four NAICS codes in the very middle of that circle diagram as the major environmental NAICS codes that you can specifically look at and you know that that is probably an environmental requirement. If the, if the contract uh, or, or the buy or the order is assigned a NAICS code of that type, then it's likely to be an environmental requirement because it was either for environmental consulting, that's the top one, remediation, that 562910, or one of the, the hazardous waste, either treatment and or transport and disposal, which are those 562112 and 562211. But those NAICS codes with then the framework of government-wide category management either fit into engineering, sometimes facilities, research and development. Uh, they could also be considered part of a, a medical uh, category if it's something like cleaning up medical waste, even though that's hazardous material and you think that, hey, we're, we're, we're storing this properly, disposing of it properly, it would still be uh, considered maybe a, a medical type of uh, requirement, not an environmental requirement. So that's one way of looking at and defining environmental services for the federal government. Uh, the other way is through the product and service codes. And this is actually how government-wide category management is truly defined. Each product and service code um, is tied back to a specific subcategory, which is then tied back to a specific large category. Um, so you can see here, we pulled together a list. Uh, when I was doing work on the environmental subcategory a few years ago, we were trying to define what that is because it's not defined in, in the real framework. So we were trying to figure out what does it really mean though to the end users, agencies whose mission it is to either provide environmental services to the public, clean things up, uh, or do studies as they're, as they're building new facilities and infrastructure uh, that have environmental implications. Uh, so we took a look at the whole list of, of product and service codes out there uh, and pulled some of those in that typically apply themselves to environmental uh, requirements. Uh, so there's a whole list of them and all of these are, are four characters in some way or another. Uh, but anything that was listed under an AH uh, is considered natural resources, environmental research and development. Seems pretty clear cut that that would be part of environmental. Uh, then there's the whole class of BPSC codes, those special studies and analysis. And some of them are very, very clearly related, related to environmental services. I didn't want to list them all here, um, but some of them are related to natural resource conservation, environmental protection studies, uh, and climate studies, that type of stuff. Uh, there's also then some other ones that often are used in environmental services, uh, but they are related to oftentimes to other types of categories. So engineering and technical services are 425. Uh, as I mentioned in, in one of the initial slides, environmental engineering is a common requirement for the federal government, but it's considered engineering, not really environmental. 
so we see this a lot. So an R425 kind of engineering uh, requirement, but sometimes you have to get into the specifics of what that contract is really written for or to see that it's for environmental engineering. Uh, and it makes a difference because there are very specific industry partners, contractors out there that do environmental engineering that don't do other types of engineering. They don't do materials engineering. They don't do civil engineering. They don't do construction management type of engineering. They just do environmental engineering. So sometimes it's important to know where you would find these requirements and who might be providing those types of services to the federal government. Um, the other one is the R-499, and this is a classic miscellaneous kind of code. It's for all that other professional support, uh, which is sometimes considered management advisory services. Uh, this is often used, though, when you need to bring in a contractor support, maybe as a subject matter expert, to help you formulate uh, a plan, how to tackle maybe sustainable procurement, um, or to put together a sustainable procurement plan for your agency, or, or help you with your agency policy. Uh, in regards to how you're going to deal with your particular agency's climate change, uh, sustainability approach, et cetera. Uh, the last set of PSC codes are all, all those PSC codes in F, and that is for natural resources management. Ironically, that's considered part of facilities and construction, uh, which I don't really know why, because when we think about natural resources management, we usually we're talking about the actual resources uh, you know, on the earth, maybe it's trees, maybe it's rocks, maybe it's any other thing, crops that we might be uh, you know, somehow either exploiting or using uh, for the, the good of everybody out there. Um, but it's considered facilities and construction. So it is difficult to define what environmental services really are when it comes to the federal government, because the way that we define services in general doesn't really apply to it. Um, so this, if you're looking for a particular type of environmental service, you might find it in some of these government-wide categories, research and development, tech and engineering, management advisory services, and facilities and construction. What do we spend as the federal government, though, on environmental services? So um, I put together some numbers based off of the NAICS codes that I showed you, the, those main four NAICS codes, and then also the the product and service codes that we identified as being fairly clear that they're a, you know, for environmental requirements. Of course, this isn't a complete picture because we are missing all those NAICS codes for engineering that really could have been environmental engineering. Uh, we're missing engineering PSC codes that were really for environmental engineering. Same with the management advisory. Maybe you had a consultancy firm come in that was providing consultation specifically for an environmental project. Uh, or environmental policy adaptation, that type of thing. Uh, so these numbers are definitely not com complete by any means, but they represent at least a good slice of the pie when it comes to what the government spends for environmental services. So if you look at it by the NAICS codes example, you can see for last fiscal year, Department of Energy was the largest spender. Uh, they spent over four and a half billion dollars. I think in, uh, by these NAICS codes, the government overall spent over nine billion dollars. Uh, and that's just for a limited snapshot of, of that spend picture. And the reason why Department of Energy is the biggest spender is because they manage uh, some of the largest Superfund sites uh, in, in the world, I would say. Uh, some, same sites like Hanford that I mentioned earlier, uh, cleaning up all the, the Cold War plutonium. And not only that, but uh, nuclear energy development and use uh, at the early atomic age. Uh, so they're dealing with that. Uh, Savannah River site is another good example of, uh, there's a, quite a few other places that DOE manages, and they're huge remediation sites. Um, you'd think that EPA would be the larger one, but that's not true. It's actually Department of Energy. Army is the second largest, uh, according to the NAICS codes out there. Um, and I would say primarily this is because this includes Army Corps of Engineers data. Army Corps of Engineers, once again, often responsible for remediation and reclamation projects. If you think about dredging, uh, you know, uh, beach, uh, I can't remember the term for it now, revitalization. Uh, that is oftentimes the Army Corps of Engineers duty and mission in many cases. Uh, and that's usually considered reclamation or remediation as well. And then there's EPA, as you might expect. You know, They also manage a lot of super fun sites and super fun projects. But as I mentioned, they also do a lot of environmental emergency response. Um, so they have to be prepared for that across the country as well. And then the rest of the DOD uh, does, a, of course, a lot of work in, related to environmental projects. Oftentimes, though, it's more related to their facilities 
big bases, you know, Air Force bases, naval stations out there um, that have to take the surrounding environment into consideration, especially if they're going to be uh, de demolishing buildings or, or building new uh, infrastructure, uh, then they usually have associated environmental requirements as well. If you look at it from the product service code perspective, it does change a little bit, although we're still looking about $8 billion or, or more uh, for the federal government. Um, Army tends to be, in this case, though, the, the larger buyer, um, just because at the product service code level, for think of those massive uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts, uh, where each task order or, or call maybe of a blanket like, purchase agreement gets a specific product service code, which can be uh, more fine-tuned to what's actually being acquired by the federal government. So it does change a little bit here, but Army and, and Department of Energy, once again, are the two largest agencies that are uh, procuring uh, environmental services for the government. The interesting thing, though, is, is beyond that, though, it's not the EPA, it's actually the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and I didn't get into the weeds of the, the data on this, so I don't really quite understand what it is that uh, they're purchasing that's under a PSC code, but I would guess, uh, because I do live in the western U.S., uh, that it has a lot more to do maybe with forestry, conservation, especially uh, with the amount of money that's been spent on, on natural resources and, and a natural resource conversation or conservation um, uh, throughout the last few years where it's been a high priority for them. So that's a, a snapshot of where we're at as far as our, our spend and impact for the federal government on environmental services in particular. Um, it's a large chunk of industry though. It's a large chunk of money that goes to industry. Um, and some of the things that are spurring that spend and may increase that spend in the near future are a few things that I've listed out here. Uh, the first one is the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is pouring a lot of money across the, the, the nation through many different agencies into different infrastructure projects. Um, as I mentioned in the last slide, a lot of the money that's being currently spent or has been spent in recent years, especially by DOD, uh, but will soon probably encapsulate other agencies as well, maybe more transportation and, and Department of Commerce, um, is surrounding infrastructure that they're putting into place, uh, whether it's you know remodeling, building new, or demolishing um, old and dilapidated infrastructure. Uh, each of those types of requirements has usually a, a correlating environmental requirement as well. So uh, if there's a new bridge that needs to be built, there's going to need to be an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. It's a requirement uh, as part of the National Environmental Protection Act uh, that, that agencies have to, to do that, conduct that. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers goes through this a lot. Um, in many cases, there may be other kind of ancillary work such as uh, cultural uh, or historical surveys, archeological work that needs to be done uh, associated before any ground is broken on any project. Uh, GSA also being you know, the largest provider of public building spaces is well, uh, well aware of this and uh, at any time they have to do anything to any of their buildings. Um, there's usually an environmental impact as well. Um, so these orders are being cut all the time for specific tasks in many cases, and oftentimes at very small dollar amounts, uh, but it does add up. So all the money that's being currently uh, poured right now through the bill uh, will likely have also a, an increase in send in or increase in need for spending money towards environmental requirements. So it's important to know how can I find a solution for it. Uh, lastly, or not lastly, uh, the next thing though is some of those executive orders that Katie mentioned. Uh, this may not have a direct impact on the amount of money being spent, but it will have an impact on how you spend that money as the acquisition workforce for the federal government. Uh, you may be uh, required to build in some of those terms and conditions that Katie mentioned, or you may be looking for contracts that have already done that for you, which is one of the things that GSA does quite well. We write contracts, at least Federal Acquisition Service does, we write contracts that allow other agencies to use, uh, and those oftentimes have those terms, conditions, clauses already built into them. Um, speaking of which, though, there also will are some changes that may be coming to the FAR. Uh, in most cases, they probably will be implemented. Um, and so you will need to be aware, uh, do I need to include a clause in my contract? Or is it already included in the contract that I'm going to use? Um, and I can tell you from our portfolio's perspective, uh, we're trying to be on the leading edge of this. Uh, we've developed, we're developing a new contract program right now. And there was a lot of talk about how we're going to address these, these FAR changes either currently or in the near future. So those are some of the things that may have an impact on how you are acquiring services in general, uh, but in particular environmental services as well. 
So let's talk about the solutions. Uh, if you need to acquire services, environmental services, uh, what is out there that you can use without having to start from scratch and build something from the ground up? The first thing that GSA maintains is the multiple award schedules program. Uh, you've probably heard this if you're buying products uh, or services. It's been around for years. It's a, it's a great program. It's a streamlined acquisition environment based off of FAR 8.4. Uh, and it can be very easy to use if you understand how to use it correctly. Uh, if you're a purchase card holder and you're using GSA Advantage to buy cleaning supplies, environmentally friendly cleaning supplies, of course, um, or electronics that meet the EP designation, of course, uh, then you're probably using schedules to do that as well. Uh, so schedules are, are kind of the backbone for a lot of things that the government buys already, um, but they can be a great source for environmental services as well. For the schedules in particular, uh, we have a couple special item numbers that relate back to those NAICS codes that I initially said I think of as kind of the, the core NAICS codes that represent environmental services. Uh, and that's 541620 for environmental consulting, 562112 for hazardous waste disposal services. Keep in mind that doesn't include treatment. Uh, and then, excuse me, uh, two sins for remediation services. Uh, the two cents for remediation, I wouldn't worry so much about the difference. It's really just a matter of, of business size uh, and which ones are considered large and which ones are considered small. Uh, but one thing that you'll want to be cautious of is depending on your particular requirement, there could be some restrictions in using some of these solutions out there. So for example, hazardous waste, uh, while you can do electronic waste recycling and medical waste disposal and pharmaceutical waste disposal, uh, you can't do services under this that are disposal or transportation of radioactive waste unless it's the low level medical kind of radioactive waste. Uh, we, you cannot get asbestos or uh, lead paint abatement type services or mitigation services for radon under this one. We built in some of these restrictions uh, more for liability reasons than anything else. Uh, but there are a lot of other services available under those types of SINs. But those aren't the only SINs where you might find the solution through a, a industry partner or contractor. Um, we have a lot of other ones that aren't directly related to environmental, but are often used in conjunction with environmental requirements. So engineering services, once again, if you actually need an environmental engineering firm, you may find them oftentimes under the engineering SIN of 501330ENG, uh, but they may also sometimes just have 501620 that's the uh, environmental consulting uh, services in on their scheduled contract. So I would look both places. Uh, and when I say look both places, I recommend using that MRAS process that Katie mentioned earlier. It's an excellent tool to do that uh, RFI and, and uh, kind of market research component. Uh, but some other types of services often associated with environmental requirements are GIS services. Uh, our portfolio maintains one of the SINs, that's the GIS SIN, but then the IT category also maintains a, a similar special item number under the GEO or Earth Observation Solutions SIN. Uh, testing lab services, if you need a contractor to come in and at least just test the, the soil that you're digging up or the water that you're pulling from test wells, uh, they can do that as well. You can get contract support for that. Uh, there's also energy services and, and other random technical consulting services uh, under both the 501690 uh, SIN and the 501690 E SIN. One of those SINs is owned by the facilities and construction category because it's about building efficiency and resource efficiency for infrastructure. Um, so we don't own all of these. My portfolio doesn't own, own all these solutions, um, but the MAS program overall supports them. Then there's R&D, there's miscellaneous professional technical services. If you need a specialized consultant to come in and tell you about the, the infrastructure grid for the power supply, how it may impact wildfire risks, uh, you know, you might find that under a very specialized uh, contractor that might have a home under 541990. Uh, then there's the facilities maintenance and management uh, special item number, which once again is owned by the facilities category. Uh, of course, a lot of environmental requirements are directly related to a facility or a base or uh, an accumulation of facilities, uh, so, um, you know, some sort of training compounds, et cetera. Uh, so you might find services related directly to a facility that have an environmental uh, component to them under that. And then lastly, though, I also included the training sins uh, because if you need a contracting firm to come in and provide hazardous material uh, awareness and, and handling training to your own employees. Uh, we have many firms that actually do that under 611430. You also can acquire other training type services under the technical or uh, 
talent development sin that's the 611430 td that's owned actually by our our sister portfolio the human capital uh, folks so there's a lot of other ways you can get services related to environmental requirements through some of these sins but this is not an exhaustive list uh, there are depending on what your particular requirement is uh, there might be another special item number out there under the schedules program that works for you but the reasons you might consider using the schedules program is because, as I mentioned earlier, it's a streamlined acquisition process that you do under FAR 8.4. Uh, you can do fixed price labor hours, time and materials type requirements. The, the pricing is already negotiated at the contract level. Uh, and for most agencies, you can take that as being fair and reasonable, unless you're DOD, you have to do your own fair and reasonable determination. Uh, but there's a, a bunch of other advantages to, to using the schedules program uh, from the fact that we already have the contractors, they're already aware and are, are experienced with dealing with the federal government. They at least have a GSA contract, even if they don't have other work uh, with other federal agencies. But in most cases, to get that contract or the schedules program, they have to demonstrate some experience working with the federal government in most cases. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, they could have just done co commercial contracts in the past, um, and they may stumble a little bit sometimes when they're dealing with the new agencies they've never worked with before. But for the most part, our industry partners under the schedules program are, are quite capable of doing work for the federal government and experience doing that. Um, you can also access a lot of small businesses this way. And you can see here that there's a lot of speed involved in, in doing an acquisition under the schedules program, uh, where you can, uh, you, the average PALT time, so from the day that you solicit a requirement to the day that you award it, uh, is about 80 days, uh, give or take. And that is going to you know, depend a lot on your particular requirement and, and how you need to award it. Um, but you can see that it's fairly short in, in the terms of, of services, because we're just talking about environmental services. Um, it, it can be fairly short compared to a lot of other ways you can do this type of contracting. Uh, one of the other benefits you should be aware of, of using the schedules program to acquire services is that you can also get other direct costs through what we call the order level materials sin. Uh, and this is, uh, there are some limitations to it, uh, but you can acquire non-schedule items and non-schedule services, meaning that the contractor doesn't have a particular item on their schedule contract, or they don't have a particular labor category on their schedule contract, but they can still provide it under the order level materials sin. There are some rules around that, including that the amount of order level materials can't exceed 33% of the value of your order or your blanket purchase agreement um, in it. Also, uh, can't there is a certain couple of ways they have to provide the pricing for that. And they have to have own cost comparisons. Of course, they have to have that SIN as part of their scheduled contract as well. Uh, so there are some, some rules around it. If you're interested more in the order level materials SIN, there's a completely a separate class for it and, and a pretty short but easy to read guide on acquiring order level materials SINs as well. So if you have some complex environmental requirements, uh, say you need to have you know, some field testing done, and then I, I need a biologist to kind of put all that field data together, analyze it, produce a report, uh, but at the same time, I also need them to bring some specialized equipment out there to do that type of testing. Maybe that equipment's not on their scheduled contract. They could still provide that equipment as an order level material, as long as it doesn't go past some of those limitations. So it's something to consider uh, if you have requirements that have ODCs, uh, but you wanna use the, the schedules program. This is just one example uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers where they acquire resource efficiency management services through the schedules. Uh, they actually set up a, a blanket purchase agreement and they have seven different prime contractors under that blanket, blanket purchase agreement. They did it under the, the engineering SIN, even though this is for resource efficiency management services, which I would consider an environmental requirement. Uh, but you can see the description there it's to improve facility energy efficiency, promote use of renewable energy, reduce GHGs, et cetera. Uh, but they were able to do this successfully under the schedules program, 100% small business set aside. It was only 51 days uh, solicited and they were able to make awards within 175 days. Uh, of course, it was a bit more complex for them because they were setting up, setting up a multiple award BPA. They had to evaluate several different offers. Uh, they were actually able to make uh, awards to all seven offerers, uh, but this thing is worth about $45 million. So it took a little bit longer to make those awards. But it is one good example of how the Army Corps of Engineers has utilized the schedules program to acquire environmental services. Then there are our IDIQ programs. This is the other way that you can acquire environmental services through GSA primarily. Uh, this is, we have what we call the OASIS contract. Uh, that stands for One Acquisition Source for Integrated Services. 
Um, within that, while it's designed primarily just for professional services, um, it's not specific towards environmental services, it does have a lot of those, like I mentioned earlier, related NAICS codes um, or, or special item numbers, uh, although these ones aren't really special item numbers, they're NAICS codes, uh, a lot of them built into the contract itself. So it does address environmental consulting services under 541620. You can see that you can also acquire engineering services, GIS services, testing, other miscellaneous scientific professional, research and development uh, services under the OASIS contract program, um, as well as a very specific type of engineering related to the National Energy Policy Act of 1992. I don't see very much of those requirements come through here. Um, but these are the types of services you can acquire under OASIS, which is not a schedule. Uh, that could be related to or primarily be an environmental requirement for services. Uh, it's why I mentioned though it's not a schedule is because you're not using FAR 8.4 ordering procedures, you're using FAR 16 ordering procedures, uh, uh, specifically 16505 ordering procedures. Um, so it's good to know there's a big difference there because there are some requirements about using OASIS that are different than using the schedules program that you need to be aware of. But if you are looking for environmental services that relate to any of these NAICS codes that you see on this list, um, or even other ones too, if maybe you need financing for an environmental project or program, uh, financing support, uh, that's also available. But OASIS is designed around NAICS codes. And you can see the ones that are, are listed here might be related to an environmental services requirement. I also wanted to talk though about the future of OASIS, which is OASIS Plus. Uh, this is what OASIS Plus is going to look like. Currently, OASIS has uh, seven, no, six, six different pools, no, seven different pools, excuse me, uh, that are focused primarily on engineering, financial services, and then research and development. Uh, that's basically the focus of that contract. You can get environmental services under the, that contract program, uh, but it has to be related to one of those NAICS codes that I showed you. Uh, but we're building the future replacement for OASIS, calling it OASIS Plus. I know it's very inventive, uh, but this is what it's going to contain as far as the scope goes. Uh, you can see it's going to cover the current scope of OASIS, including that tech and engineering, research and development, management advisory services, as well as logistics. Uh, but we recognize there was a need for and a demand for a specific domain for environmental services, because there are a lot of contract providers out there that do some very specific types of environmental related services, like I mentioned, environmental engineering firms, uh, maybe environmental policy uh, firms that can provide consultation and expertise on, on policy development. Um, that might be considered management advisory under OASIS currently. Uh, but under the new OASIS Plus, those firms will have a home under the environmental domain. And if you have requirements that fit in the environmental domain, that will be a great place to go to find the right industry partners that can do the right work that you need. Uh, because we're looking at their capability and their experience within the perspective of just the environmental domain. And I'll tell you what that means a little bit in a second. Um, but this will be the, the future of OASIS. So we're gonna, like I mentioned, expand the scope out to include areas that we previously don't cover with OASIS, including the environmental domain, also intelligence services, uh, enterprise solution services, which are really large, big dollar value requirements. Um, and this will be under phase one. Phase two, which we haven't gotten to yet, we need to stand the contract up and get it running first. Uh, we'll have some other domains as well. So if you happen to do work that touches in any of these ones, uh, in the future, you'll be able to take advantage of those domains to, to reach the right industry partners that do that type of work, like marketing, PR, human capital, financial services, et cetera. But I wanted to show this to you because I wanted to stress that we are going to establish a separate environmental domain. The way that we established it was we took a look at current requirements that the government is procuring for environmental services based on some of those NAICS codes that I showed you earlier, based on those product and service codes that I showed you earlier. Uh, and then we took a look at the details of those requirements. What is it they're acquiring when they use a, you know, a, a product service code of F uh, or a product service code that starts with AH? What is that requirement? Um, you know, what is it when they use a remediation NAICS codes? What kind of things are they remediating? Um, so we took a look at all sorts of different requirements that the government has had in the last several years. And uh, we tried to kind of summarize it. Uh, you can see here, this is just the summary of what this domain could entail, uh, but it is really focusing in on you know, requirements that an agency needs to meet environmental objectives, whether that's getting experts to do R&D work, whether that's cleaning up the earth, uh, whether it's uh, cleaning up buildings, 
or providing uh, consultation and expertise uh, for, for environmental policy and planning, that type of work. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the building infrastructure law, you know, that work could also involve uh, environmental impact statement support or, or environmental assessment support. Uh, but the main, the main bulk of money that is spent by the government is oftentimes in remediation and reclamation work, which if you go back to the OASIS uh, slide right here, you'll notice that OASIS does not have the remediation NAICS code covered by it. So you cannot currently get remediation and reclamation services done under OASIS. You will be able to under OASIS Plus, under that environmental services domain. Um, so that's why we did key in and focus in on, on that as well when it came to how we developed this domain. Uh, this is another big long list of different types of services that we included. This is not an exhaustive list. I had to like edit this in about half, um, but these are just sample types of services that we know the government often requires uh, that would fit into this domain. So if you see anything on this list that looks kind of important to your agency's mission currently, uh, then it will probably be covered under, under the environmental domain. If you don't see it and you think it should be, please let me know. Uh, because we would we want to make sure we're reaching the right industry partners within this domain that provide the specific type of environmental service that you need. Uh, one example I will point out though is the uh, the PFAS uh, bullet over here on the left hand side. Uh, as Katie mentioned I, or Melissa mentioned, I believe uh, there is a whole new uh, document and the the the. GPC on, on PFAS and how agencies, what they need to know about it, how they can become educated on it. Uh, we heard this loud and clear through a lot of uh, agency stakeholder engagement sessions, um, especially for those agencies that were dealing with base operations support or infrastructure management, meaning facility management as well. Um, the Air Force in particular, their civil engineering group uh, oftentimes is dealing with this right now, because if you're aware of, uh, you know, a flame retardant material for uh, for planes in particular, if there is a plane crash or engine fire or something like that, uh, for the last couple of decades, those those retardant materials contained PFAS chemicals, uh, and now a lot of agencies are dealing with the uh, the results of that, uh, which means that if it was ever used, whether for an actual fire or for testing, uh, that it may have gotten into nearby groundwater. Um, so this this is something we heard loud and clear from. Just, just the Air Force as an example, but other agencies as well, is that, hey, we need contractors under this environmental domain that understand PFAS, understand how to assess it, and give us an idea of what to do with it. Um, so we did a lot of engagement to try to formulate the scope of this particular domain, and I wanted to give you some examples here. Uh, you can see here, we're including several different NAICS codes under this domain. A lot of these are repeats of what you've already seen, including all those engineering ones, environmental consulting. But the big one is that we're including those hazardous waste collection and treatment NAICS codes, as well as remediation NAICS codes um, and facility support services. So we tried to make this domain really kind of encompass all the types of services you would really need for environmental requirements. As, as I mentioned earlier, it's hard to define those. Uh, but if it falls within any of these NAICS codes that would be part of the environmental domain. Uh, so some of the reasons why you would use OASIS now, and hopefully you will use OASIS Plus in the future, um, is because, as I mentioned, we're trying to get to the right industry base. And by doing that, we're, we're vetting them at a high, pretty high basis, meaning that they have to demonstrate lots of years of experience, uh, you know, many different contracts that they, they've done for those types of services, either with the federal government or, or even in the commercial marketplace. Um, so we wanted to get the best in each of these domains to provide the right types of services. There are some flexibilities in ordering under OASIS, not as flexible maybe as a schedules program, but if for some agencies that do cost type contracting for this type of work, uh, that is an available option under OASIS currently, which is it is not under the schedules program. Uh, this is a considered a best in class contract. Uh, OASIS Plus we're building to be considered a BIC as well. Uh, and then you can see that we have a lot of industry support and industry engagement uh, with OASIS. It's a smaller group of contractors. It'll be a smaller group of contractors under OASIS Plus as well. So it's a bit easy for us uh, to engage with them directly. And sometimes play matchmaker if, if you're looking for industry partners and you want to find out more about what they're capable of providing when it comes to environmental services. Uh, we can help with that as well. Uh, here's another example of an actual award that has gone uh, out. We've seen several of them under OASIS, but this is just one example uh, for the Air Force, uh, where they had a requirement for environmental restoration planning, programming, budget, and technical service. So along with the environmental restoration planning, they had a bunch of other ancillary type services that they needed to capture under one task order. And they were able to do that 
utilizing NAICS code 51620 as the principal purpose. But you can see they did this in a very short amount of time, 14 days solicited. They made an award in 33 days. Uh, that's because I believe they did this as a sole source. Oh, no, I take that back. This was competed. They had two offers. Uh, but they did a lot of market research beforehand uh, to ensure that they were going to get responses back from industry uh, and knew that they would get small business to, to be interested and compete for this. Um, and it wasn't, this wasn't uh, chump change either. This is $26.3 million. Uh, so they could do it very quickly under the OASIS program. So that's about the extent of it as far as environmental services and what you can get right now uh, through some of the GSA contract programs that we offer. Um, I did wanna make sure I mention this slide because currently the customer loyalty survey is, is going on right now. It closes on June 28th. We would love it if you use the, any of the multiple award schedules for professional services or OASIS or HCATS, which is our Human Capital and Training Services IDIQ. We would love to hear back from you if you are a user of any of those services uh, or contract programs and let us know uh, what you think about them and how we can improve them. So there is a link on this slide. I believe it'll be sent out after this day. So other than that, I am done and hopefully we save some time for questions and answers. Yeah, definitely. That's great information, Brian. Thank you so much. I, uh, I see some questions that are being answered uh, by CSD colleagues. Um, CSD colleagues, did you catch anything that uh, should go directly to Brian for answering? Uh, also, um, I wanted to kind of use a poll to uh, kind of get a better understanding if I can get my screen to stop. While you're looking at that, there was a question from Eric saying uh, that says, uh, just wondering if there's a difference in databases uh, has been explained to our customers by the developers of these two systems. I think they're talking about Oasis and uh, in another system um, or, and or the respective program managers. Have you heard if it has caused any problems? Eric, if you wanna unmute, if you have, if you wanna be more specific about your question. Hi, oh. uh, Lorena, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. And the question would, would be to, uh, to uh, uh, Brian, but go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so I'm just curious if if this uh, difference in the two databases uh, has been explained to some of the customers on the FAST side who use that, because some of the uh, like Department of Interior customers uh, for us have uh, have said that, uh, oh, you're talking about the ordering system. Uh, we took the training and it just doesn't seem to be uh, applicable to occupancy agreements. And I'm like, the more I looked into it, then <laughs> the more I found out that these two systems use the same acronym, which is, I find just like baffling <laughs> that That's, they would yeah. use the same acronym um, yeah. and, you know, not explain that, at least on the rollout on the PBS side uh, to some of the, some or all of the customers. And I'm wondering on on if, if FAST is experiencing any of this, uh, hearing any feedback from their customers. Eric, that is a great question and great point. Uh, we were kind of caught blindsided by it. Um, we established the OASIS contract program uh, from FAS back in 2014. And right. PBS just recently established their own occupancy agreement, something, something database. Uh, and we started getting random questions as well. And finally we figured out, oh, there's a PBS okay. Oasis now. <laughs> so there was no communication at the top level when they developed their own acronym, which is the duplicate of ours. Um, we are, because we keep getting repeat questions about this, we are developing uh, just some quick message material uh, for our National Customer Service Center because that's typically where questions come in from. Um, so if a customer mistakenly sends an email to oasis at gsa.gov, but they're actually talking about PBS oasis at gsa.gov, uh, there is going to be an automated response saying that you are referring to the PBS system. Please go here with your question uh, because they're very different. One of them is an occupancy yeah. database. One of them is a contract program for services. So <laughs> right. thanks for bringing that up. You bet. And, and we got word that just the other day that 
the PBS Oasis, which I put the acronym, what it stands for in the chat box. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, has been delayed, I think, another four weeks. So it, it won't come online until August. But I'm like, gosh, did anybody think of this? Because <laughs> you're, you're right. The FAS Oasis has been... Um, um, you know, online and working for several years. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of shocked they didn't do a quick search to figure out, does GSA already have that acronym somewhere? <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Eric. We appreciate the, the conversation as well as I did want to share uh, that there's more information on sustainable acquisition uh, located on the acquisition gateway. Uh, a lot of broad topics. Uh, that are discussed and information that's shared. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for your presentation, highlighting what's happening in the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories. Uh, question to you, what's the latest on Oasis Plus? <laughs> uh, yeah, for us, that is the question of the day. Uh, the latest is that the RFP which is the request for proposal, the final RFP is supposed to be going out very soon. Um, I cannot provide you a specific date. It's been delayed and delayed and delayed, uh, but we are inches away from the finish line on getting that out the door. After that, of course, uh, as soon as we do issue that, then we have about a 90 day window for the solicitation. Uh, we're going to hopefully go through that 90 days fairly quickly protest free would be great uh, but then uh, we'll we'll be able to make our source selection and awards for the very first phase i didn't mention this but uh, after we make those initial awards oasis plus will open back up for new contractors to apply which is different than what we did with oasis so if you work with industry partners that are interested but maybe not qualified today uh, once it opens back up and they meet the qualifications they can get a contract in the near future yeah that's great information thank, thank you brian for that uh, peek uh, kind of in the side door as to what's happening with uh, the follow on to uh, such a great uh, contract vehicle uh, called Oasis. Um, I do want to uh, go ahead and end the poll at this point uh, and share the results. Uh, looks like on a scale one to 10, with 10 being the most positive. How likely would you use the information from this training to improve your work? And, and uh, looks like we're uh, we we uh, moved past the halfway mark and uh, on up uh, to where uh, more people uh, are likely to use the information they learned here today uh, in the future. And so. Um, on a scale one to 10, the 10 being the most positive, how likely would you recommend this training to a colleague? And uh, it looks again like uh, we're leaning towards more people recommending the training. And then finally, uh, how effective was the virtual delivery method for this training? And uh, again, uh, uh, most folks, uh, you know, leaning towards this was a pretty effective way uh, to get this training information out. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing uh, that information. We're going to stop recording now and uh, we'll stay online for a few minutes.